Welcome to today's forum on AI in healthcare. My name is Rebecca Flournoy, and I'm a senior health policy leader at the Kaiser Permanente Institute for Health Policy, and I will be your MC for the day. So at the Institute, we host events and publish information to shape policy and practice on important health topics, exploring ways to promote high quality, equitable health care and healthy communities. And we are so excited to see all of you here today. I think many of us are here because we see the really exciting potential that AI in healthcare could bring, the way that AI in healthcare could help us promote patient care and population health, reduce burnout among healthcare professionals, and make more healthcare more efficient, accessible, and affordable. And I think at the same time, we also recognize how critical it is to be really thoughtful about how AI is designed and implemented and monitored from the start. What needs to happen to ensure that AI and healthcare is well designed and well governed? How can we ensure that AI is safe, useful, trustworthy, and equitable? We are going to dig into these questions together today. We will start the day out with a fireside chat to hear about current uses of AI and healthcare, bringing in some examples from Kaiser Permanente. We'll then shift to a session on the future of AI in healthcare, bringing in some additional current examples, but also looking to what's on the horizon and some important considerations to keep in mind. We will then break for lunch, and then in the afternoon, we'll have a session on practice and policy and ways that we might address risks while also harnessing benefits. And then we'll hear some closing reflections at the end of the day. I know some of you submitted questions in advance, and I want to thank you for those and let you know that the moderators and speakers have seen those, and we will do everything we can to incorporate those into the presentations and the discussion. And then we'll also have a little time at the end of each panel for a couple of live audience questions as well. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are recording the event today, so please silence your devices. And if you need to make a call, please either step outside or you can see one of our staff members to see if a room might be available for use. To access information on the event today, you've probably noticed that there are cards at your tables that have information on connecting to Wi-Fi and also a QR code that'll take you to a website with the agenda and speaker bios. If you're using social media to share posts on today's event, you can mention us using the handle at KPIHP and hashtags like AI and Healthcare AI. And then a final note, here in the event space, restrooms are located behind this screen down the hall and to your left. And then emergency exits are located behind you through the doors where a lot of you came in this morning. So now I want to transition to our first conversation. I want to welcome up to the stage Tony Beretta and Vivian Tan for our opening fireside chat. Tony will introduce Vivian in just a moment. And Tony, as you come up, I will tell the audience a little about you. Tony Beretta is Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Hospitals. And in this role, he oversees our legislative and policy efforts, leading a team of legislative advocates and policy professionals. He dedicates, he, excuse me, he directs development of our public policy positions in support of the organization, our members, and the communities we serve. And I will turn it over to you, Tony. Thank you. Great. Rebecca, thank you. And let me add my welcome to all of you. It's um, it's really wonderful to see so many people come out um, you know, here at the uh, Center for Total Health. This has been a wonderful space really for the Institute for Health Policy um, to put on a number of different health policy forums. I think you know, we've, we've gotten restarted again now after the pandemic and prior to that we just had this amazing run of really interesting sessions um, and I think we're, we're back on track again, Rebecca, I think it's fair to say, um, with this as well. So I just want to welcome all of you. Um, so um, I, I, I am really happy to be able to have this role today interviewing Vivian Tan, my good friend. Um, Vivian has been with Kaiser Permanente for 16 years now, um, so she's just barely not new anymore at Kaiser Permanente. 
Um, you know, and, and she is really um, one of our key leaders within the organization who is delving deep into issues of um, AI, AI and machine learning and, and all of the others. And um, she has been, and she has a really unique perspective within the Kaiser Permanente organization because in addition to her current role as Vice President of Strategic Information Management and Global Relationships for Kaiser Permanente, the Global Relationships has her really representing Kaiser Permanente at the World Economic Forum where there's a tremendous amount of this work going on and a, a lot of policy thinking and development that's going on there. Um, she's had a number of roles within the organization that have her really um, right at the intersection of senior leadership, engaging with the most interesting things that are going on at, at Kaiser Permanente. Um, she's been you know, a key person in the organization. She and I kind of grew up together in some respects, providing support to senior leadership on key initiatives and, and public policy. Um, and still, she works very closely with our wonderful chief financial officer, Kathy Lancaster, um, on, a, on a variety of issues, and um, our CEO, Greg Adams, who takes a tremendous interest in this subject as well, and I know has all kinds of thoughts um, on, on this subject. Um, so she's currently leading a lot of the work that, that has been transformational in terms of what we're doing. Um, and what anybody who knows anything about Kaiser Permanente would know is it is a very interesting and complex organization and there's a tremendous amount of creativity that goes on in a whole range of different places and it's really I think Vivian's role is in part to keep track of all of that stuff that's going along and figure out how to get it all rowing in a common direction for the benefit of the people who we serve our members and the communities um, in which we operate so Vivian I'm delighted to be able to be here Thank with you, you for today. having me I think it's fantastic because you know a key part um, and I was just chatting with Marilyn from BPC, and, and one of the things that's really necessary in this area is just kind of explainer stuff and 101 stuff. And, you know, can we give a basic overview of what's going on? So I'll, ask this, I'll pose this question the way I pose all of my questions, as you've heard me say many times. I'm not a healthcare person. I'm a history major. So what do I need to know? What, can you tell me about the basics of AI and what's really happening right now in a way that a history major would understand it. Well, thank you, Tony, for that uh, question to start off things. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, Tony calls himself a history major, but he's, he's much more and far from that. Um, I, maybe we'll start with a primer. Some of it might be very rudimentary for you, and, and then for others, hopefully, it's helpful. So, Tony, I always like to try to think of... Um, uh, um, an analog or, or a parallel. And if you think about AI um, like human intelligence, right, and you think of the phases of, of human uh, understanding and then sense making and then actually being able to respond to it, um, AI has, like, has, you can think about the same components. So in the understanding, uh, you know, like human beings, we have five senses, right? There's a lot of AI technology to help us process a lot of structured and unstructured data. So when you think about text and images and video and you hear things like NLP or computer vision, that actually helps, uh, you can use AI techniques to ingest a lot of information. The second, uh, you know, kind of, uh, again, likened to human intelligence is the sense-making part. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to use the data that you've collected to make sense of it and find patterns in the data. And you apply machine learning techniques, deep learning techniques, reinforcement learning techniques. Uh, they're supervised and unsupervised. All these are buzzwords, but at the end of the day, you're really trying to figure out if the information has patterns to predict outcomes, to uh, diagnose things, to actually say, did this happen or did this not happen? happen. Um, and for those kinds of things for a while, they were very narrow in nature, right? You, you built a model, it could play chess, but cannot do anything else. Or it can play uh, the game of Go, as many of you uh, know, uh, with the Google uh, brain. And uh, now we're in this phase where it's maybe uh, the evolution of where it's going to self-generate uh, information and content. 
Um, and this is the rise of you know, foundational models that are based on text. If, if they are based on text, they're called LLMs. Uh, they are basically transformer-based models uh, using, again, mimicking the brain in terms of how you think about, uh, you have layers and layers of processing. And uh, you hear buzzwords like prompt engineering or RAG or uh, fine tuning. Um, and all of these things actually just um, help us uh, make sense of a lot of data. Basically, if you look at OpenAI, uh, you know, uh, chat GPT, it's been trained on every, every piece of information out there in the internet. And that, um, it's, people are speculating and actually, we have a Microsoft uh, expert here. Maybe he can he can verify this. <laughs> uh, the, the people are speculating that it's actually trained on uh, 100 trillion, uh, you know, tokens of information. This is humanly not possible to process, um, and it's very it's become very sophisticated in terms of. Uh, predicting the next word, but it's, it's essentially is a next word predictor. So it's so it's sort of a term. I mean, AI is sort of a term that covers a actually lot a of lot things. of different things. Yes, yes. So what what types of things sh are we really focusing on? What types of things should people be aware of that? Um, yeah, where this is moving. And you know, we I have a little chart uh, up there, and I know it's very busy. It's got a lot of things on it. And maybe I want to tie AI back to healthcare. Um, and you know, AI is an enabler at the end of the day. It's a tool. It's, you don't do AI for AI's sake. Uh, so I want to maybe tie a, a, a feature of healthcare with the application of AI. So the first feature of healthcare is that at the end of the day, people are heterogeneous. They are not the same. And we are, you know, uh, I think uh, one of our key leaders always say healthcare is about people caring for people. So on one hand, uh, people are heterogeneous that we're caring for, and the people that are providing that care are experts, right? And there's a lot of shortages, right? Um, we, we don't have infinite uh, resources. So you really want to match. You want to segment your populations and really match them with the right care at the right time, uh, at the right place. Um, and that takes, that can be powered by AI and that drives value. So that's, uh, you know, an example where uh, we're applying AI to healthcare in a way that drives value. So that's, that's a staffing support issue, basically. It, it can be, yes, it can, it can optimize staffing. Uh, it can optimize supply chain. So I'll give you another example, yeah. uh, healthcare, uh, is a dichotomy in a way, right? We have long lead times. Uh, if you want a nurse, you can't, you can't get a nurse, you know, uh, uh, on the spot, on demand. Uh, if you want some drug that needs to be shipped from another part of the world, so there are long lead times, and yet it's also a real-time business where um, if you don't use that bed, you don't use that exam room, you 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 know you lose it or use it or lose it right, so that dichotomy of long lead times and also um, the need to actually optimize things real time, uh, really again is another place where AI uh, w using prediction and and um, prescriptive analysis you can actually match and optimize for for your health system. So we have a lot of examples of that in Kaiser, where uh, we actually have a real-time app that's running in all 40 of our hospitals that give all our clinicians and operators, you know, up to the minute, okay, no, it's up to five minutes, huh. uh, where it's refreshed, they have it uh, at their fingertips on the go, they can see everything that's happening, and we predict sensors, we predict staffing, uh, both for the current uh, shift and two shifts out so, and beyond that. So just so I, because I, you told me about this the other day and I was yes. like blown away by this. So, so this is really real-time examination of the population currently in the hospital or I guess scheduled to go to the hospital. Yes. And, and AI is doing what with that? So AI is happy, helping with the throughput management 
Um, and the and you know if you actually have good throughput management, you also improve the um, the access and also the experience. So it, it's kind of like it makes us more efficient, mm -hmm. which has a cost impact, and it also improves the experience. Uh, you know, no patient, no member wants to be waiting <laughs> uh, for something to happen. So uh, we predict and highlight the bottlenecks and constraints in the system so that we can act on it um, you know, in the moment and, and get things resolved. So, so it's sort of, I was, I was thinking of this in terms of, um, is, is it, it's kind of predicting what this current patient population is gonna need a couple days from now. Yes, right? yes, actually in, in the same shift and two shifts out. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, what else is And cool? <laughs> we refresh that prediction on the hour every hour with new information that we have. That's remarkable. Okay, what else? So, you know, there are so many things. So we have about uh, four, 300, 300 deep learning models in production and 3,000 machine learning models in production at KP. Okay, tell me what this Segmenting means. Segmenting everything <laughs> from um, uh, we breast cancer screening and doing segmentation there, predicting uh, high risks for suicide uh, in certain populations. Uh, we have things that uh, predict COVID for a long time. Uh, we have things that um, are really looking at, we also are using ambient AI and things to support documentation and reducing clinical uh, workload. So there's so many different experiments uh, going on in different regions, I feel like uh, Dr. Ainsley, is she in the audience? Uh, she is leading a lot of amazing uh, work in the area of imaging, and I know she's going to come on uh, in the afternoon, and hopefully she can highlight some of the innovation going on in that space as well. So I think in try, a lot of this is trying to figure out, okay, we, we've been using algorithmic processing for a long time. What, what actually, um, what's different now? So I, I mean, We've, we've, for many years, we've been sort of the early flu warning system for the state of California and through that data and we do reporting. I, we're, that's probably advanced now beyond what it used to be. Yes. What's the difference between what was happening before and what's happening now? Yeah, so I think there's some things that haven't changed. We're still doing value-based uh, care uh, that is, you know, kind of en enabled by data and analytics. I think with generative AI, the difference is the speed and the scale. Mm -hmm. And I think it's both a good thing, <laughs> and there are probably things that come with it. And I, I know uh, in the afternoon, Dr. Yang is going to, uh, where's Dr. Yang? He's going to lead us in, in a conversation about benefits and risks of AI. Uh, and, and, you know, I think with, with generative AI, there's like half glass full and half glass empty. Yeah. I think the big difference is the the speed and the scale, because right. suddenly uh, I have not seen this industry and this space move this quickly right. uh, within such a short period of time. And the scale in which things can, can be done actually is, is, you know, sort of order of magnitude. And the amount of data that's being processed is, is, is mind boggling, to be frank. Okay, so when I first started reading about AI six or seven years ago, um, it was like the impending apocalypse and all of that stuff. <laughs> so um, there are things to worry about. I don't think that is the thing that's first to worry about in this context in healthcare. So what do you worry about that's in the kind of shorter period of time? Yeah, I think for healthcare, you know, the bar is higher for healthcare. And actually, rightly so. The bar is higher from a data privacy perspective, the bar is higher from a data security perspective, the bar is higher from an algorithmic perspective. So uh, we have to actually, you know, both uh, govern and regulate ourselves in, in a, you know, to the highest standard. Uh, and then we also have to work with regulators and policymakers, all of you in this room, uh, to ensure that we have the right public-private you know, collaboration as well. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it's a worry, but it, I do hold it as a key a responsibility and obligation because, you know, healthcare data is sensitive. Uh, the 
the application of that data is sensitive to. And actually with the executive orders and stuff, it, you know, it's also very clear where regulation is going, where uh, we have to ensure there's uh, transparency and we have to show that our data and models are not biased and we have to explain it. So there are, I think, a lot of things that um, are actually exciting as well about this space. So, and I know we'll have a lot of discussion of this later today, but, you know, policymakers and, and people who are observing this really focusing on the equity issue. And I think the concern, you know, the immediate concern that we see, whether it's with the Federal Trade Commission or others looking at it, is will the use of AI exacerbate existing equity issues or, which is certainly possible. Yeah. Um, is there an opportunity to actually make progress on some of the problems with health equity that we haven't been able to make as much progress on them? Yes, I'm really excited about that. And I see KP being a leader because we have taken uh, really very intentional steps to curate the right data that is uh, not biased and is very inclusive and equitable. So I'll, I'll share an example from World War II because you're a history buff here. So I'll, 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 do, I'll do an example. So uh, in World War II, they had all these planes and they were trying to figure out what part of the plane they had to reinforce uh, you know, to prevent it from, from being shot down, right? right? So they started collecting data on the planes that were coming back and they tried to figure out where the holes were, right? But there was a huge flaw in that data because the plane, some planes weren't coming back at all, right? And the places where they were most vulnerable was actually the engine, not the wings, which, you know, which the data was showing. Right. So one of the key things we really have to do with health equity data is to make sure that the data is correct. The data is robust, it's not biased, it's inclusive, it's equitable, because with AI, the data actually drives the model. So if the data is wrong <laughs> or, or not complete, the model is not good. So one of the things that we're really doing is when we do any work now, uh, we actually look through the lens of health equity. We actually check if the model performs well when we look at sub-segments, by race and ethnicity, and we're very thoughtful, you know, in terms of what models we use, if it doesn't, you know, and we actually don't use those models if it doesn't prove to be equitable. Wow. So you're fortunately, oh, yes, we need to get to getting a few questions from the audience. Okay. So if, if there are questions, um, please help me ask these questions, because as you can tell, mine are not as sophisticated as yours are likely to be. Um, so please, please think about some questions. I was, I, you know, I, I think the, um, there's so much, there's so many different types of opportunities that are in front of us. Um, first, I'm really pleased that you're in the spot where you are to help us think this through. Um, what, where do you think other organizations will be learning from what we're doing up front? What opportunities do others have that maybe they have a greater opportunity than we do um, in terms of the data they may have access to or their models differing. I mean, maybe, maybe the other way to ask is, is there something about our model that makes this a particular opportunity or a particular um, hindrance to do? Yeah, so I'll say a few things. So the first is because KP is an integrated system, um, our data uh, sources and what we call data domains are very rich and deep. So we have uh, health plan data, we have clinical data, we have uh, consumer data, uh, we have real-time data, we have retrospective data. So um, one of the things is the, the, the breadth and the depth of our data. And actually, we've got data, because we've been in existence for seven, how long now? 77, 78 years? Um, we have longitudinal data and uh, in the area of genetics we have family history um, from cradle to grave right? right and we have it for generations so our data is uh, oh and then we have a tumor bank with I don't know now like 60,000 different samples so we have such rich data that um, it's really amazing to to be able to look at all those assets and figure out how to leverage it for the for the um, 
you know, benefit of our members and patients. So that's one, I think, unique differentiator for us. Uh, the other is that actually uh, we have done a lot uh, in partnership with other systems around interoperability mm. and data exchange. And uh, we've also, I, I wouldn't say we are unique here, but we've learned a lot and we are hoping that we continue to learn and share and collaborate with many health systems across the U.S. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Um, thank you for putting this session on. I'm Kathy Curran with the Catholic Health Association. It's a really important topic and really important work. And I wanted to follow up on your on your comment about, um, <clears throat> you know, making sure we get the AI usage right from an equity perspective. But how do you do that? Because the image that comes in my mind is if you don't know that you don't know how to spell, then the dictionary is no good to you because you don't know to look in the dictionary. So how do you... What are some practical examples of how we can know what we don't know when, when, when these, um, divide, when these uh, applications are being developed and the data sources are being chosen? Yeah, that is such a good question. And um, at KP, we, we have a very practical seven-step approach, uh, which starts with the framing of the question. Uh, you know, there's a lot that you can do to ensure that your question is not biased, right? That you framed it in a way that uh, doesn't introduce bias. Uh, the second, which I talked about, was the data piece. It's so important uh, to step back and investigate if there's something critical that's missing in your data set, whether it's, um, you know, uh, whether it's an actual, uh, you know, segment of the population uh, or whether it's a dimension or feature or labeling of the data that you, you need to really concentrate on. And this is where we have taken a very multidisciplinary approach uh, where, uh, and we really go and work with the um, subject matter experts, the people that are closest to the population, the people that are doing the work day to day, the people that understand uh, the data you know, in, in a great depth, right? So, and, and we look at it from multiple kind of places. And finally, when the model is built, there are a lot of techniques to actually uh, check if the model is working well uh, and you can actually explain it. Um, so whether it's looking at counterfactuals, Lyme, attention models, uh, there are ways to actually investigate the model to make sure that the model is working. And the final thing I'll say is, Actually, most of the time, um, when you first build your model with the data, the model is actually pretty good. Um, and, but what happens over time is there is this thing called model drift. As your data changes, as you get new data in, your model doesn't get as, as good at predicting whatever outcome uh, or, or, you know, prescribing or making a recommendation on something. So managing model drift with continuous model management is critical. Um, I, I could not stress this over and over again uh, because, you know, people, people spend all the time doing the upfront work and then once it's in production, I think there's a little bit of a culture of, you know, forget, right? So you put it in and then you forget about it where that continuous um, management of it is critical. Mm. So we got to keep, so there's got, actually a critical human role in making sure that this doesn't go off the rails. Absolutely. Actually, maybe if there's a chance to put the next slide on. I try to keep things very simple. So this is my ABCD uh, chart of, uh, you know, the ingredients it takes to, to actually have uh, AI at scale, uh, in any, probably in any organization. Uh, so first, uh, you, and I'm not going to go in, in any uh, sequence necessarily, uh, but uh, you have to first have, uh, you know, infrastructure, right? And in terms of uh, cloud uh, infrastructure, and I know we have, uh, we, we use uh, Microsoft Azure for a lot of our data and analytics, and we, we have a leader from that organization here with us today. Uh, but 
the infrastructure without the talent is also not helpful. So you know you have to actually hire uh, and and retain uh, very good talent. Uh, and then with the data that we have curated, which we have a lot of in this organization, um, and then applying the AI techniques that I talked about, uh, you know, those are the ingredients of success, if you will. There are probably other things, but you know, the, these are sort of the basic four ingredients that go in to help an organization scale. Awesome. Well, Vivian, as always, I learn a ton whenever I talk to you, and fortunately, you're here all day, so yes. people have an opportunity to, to buttonhole her as the day goes on. So um, let me ask you all uh, to join me in thanking Vivian for starting out this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you so much, Tony and Vivian, for all those great examples and making it very real. I really loved that session. And now I am very excited to welcome our first full panel to the stage. The co this co next conversation on the future of AI and healthcare will be moderated by Dr. A Ainsley McLean, who is Chief Medical Information Officer and Chief AI Officer for the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. Dr. McLean oversees a team of software engineers, physician informaticists, and clinical analysts in the design and implementation of technology, AI, and telehealth enhancements. She is founder and a co-executive sponsor of the Permanente Medicine Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence, and she's certified by and on the board for the American Board of AI and Medicine. She is also an associate medical director overseeing radiology teams and ultras in an ultrasound program that spans 20 different specialties. Dr. McLean, thank you so much for joining us and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, thank you. Let's keep going. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. I really want to thank the um, KP Institute for Policy uh, for putting on this conversation. At this moment in time, we're at such a point of excitement looking forward, and conversations like this are critical in ensuring that um, everything is done well for our patients. So thank you so much. So I'm going to introduce our first panelist, and I'll let you know a little bit about how this is going to work. So each of our panelists, um, who are amazing, are going to actually give some brief comments and an overview of uh, their opinions on what the future of AI and healthcare holds. And then we'll sit up here together and we'll have a little conversation. And then we'll have an opportunity for some of you to ask questions as well. So I hope it's really engaging. Um, and, and again, we're going to be now moving from the present to the future. So our first panelist is Dr. Junaid Bajwa. He's the chief medical scientist for Microsoft Research. And he's going to be talking about an exercise of our imagination. Our next panelist is Dr. Julia adler milstein She's the Chief of the Division of Clinical Informatics and Digital Transformation and Director for the Center for Clinical Informatics and Improvement Research at UCSF. And she's going to be talking about AI at UCSF Health. And our final panelist is uh, Dr. Judy Gachoya, who is an Associate Professor of Radiology and Informatics and an Interventional Radiologist at Emory. She's going to be talking about the future of AI in healthcare, capacity building for an AI-enabled future. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. I might stand here, if that's okay. I'm tall enough as it is. So, um, good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Junaid Bajwa. I'm the Chief Medical Scientist at Microsoft Research. I'm a practicing physician in the UK's National Health Service, um, and I'm delighted to be here. My sincere thanks to the KP team for the kind introduction. Feel free to connect with me on your social poison of choice, if that could be helpful. Very happy to, to engage in conversations. Before I start, we've spoken a little bit about these new tools. And without making any judgments, how many of you use these, have used any of these tools in the last year? Just a show of hands. Who, if you, who hasn't ever used any of these? 
Okay, so a fair few. How many of you have used them for work? Okay, interesting. Okay, fine. That's a nice baseline for me to start with. So one of my challenges was to think about actually how do we just ground everybody in what we potentially will begin to, to discuss a little bit about today. So I've spent most of the last 20 odd years across the payer, provider, regulatory, life sciences, and now big tech side, side of healthcare. So one might argue that I just never stopped doing rotations. And the other argument is I just wanted to make my mum really proud and make sure that I do lots of different things with my life. Uh, so I sit on the board of the MHRA, which is the UK's equivalent of the FDA. I'm on the board of a large academic medical centre in the UK known as UCLH. Um, and the thing that really drives me is impact at scale and, and really thinking through not just health equity, but population health, reducing the cost of care of of healthcare, but also improving the experience of care for those on the receiving side of healthcare, but also on the delivery side of healthcare too. And Satya Nadella, a few years ago, who's the CEO of Microsoft, said that AI is technology's most important priority and healthcare its most urgent application. I think the context for this is really some of the supply and demand challenges that we have globally. So we have an increasing aging population with increasing complex comorbidities, and we have a massive workforce crisis in most parts of the world. The World Health Organization pre-pandemic estimated that the world will have 14 million less doctors, nurses, and pharmacists on the planet than what society would need. I would argue post-pandemic, we're closer to about 25 million less doctors, nurses, and pharmacists by 2030 than what society will need. So within six years, we have a massive challenge around who will be delivering care for this aging population with complex comorbid needs. Um, I'm a, I teach at a range of institutions, so in the Boston ecosystem and the West Coast as well. Um, and this kind of role of technology, if you kind of take this graph on the left-hand side, and I apologize for the font size being very tiny, just shows the rise of technology across all industries over time. And on the right-hand side, something that Vivian was referencing around the size of models that now exist and the scale that exists to inform these models. So thinking about data, compute power, and the parameters. And many of you would have heard of GPT or other similar models, and we'll talk a little bit about what they might mean in a moment. But the, what's really interesting is how they're now democratized. Everybody has access to them. Many of you in this room have raised your hand, may have played with them to say, write me a poem or help me make a travel itinerary. And it's almost quite magical when you start looking at these and you start to interact with these tools in novel ways. But what we're seeing is language understanding, reading comprehension, image recognition, speech recognition, handwriting recognition, surpassing human performance now around kind of the 2020 mark. And it's probably best if we demonstrate this through a series of some examples. So if you were to go to Copilot today and type in something like this, so what is metformin? Many of you will probably know what metformin is, but the response it will give you is this. And it will tell you that metformin is a prescription medication to treat type 2 diabetes and provide you some additional data. If you carry on the conversation underneath to say, can anyone with type 2 diabetes take it? it'll start to tell you about who can and who can't take it. So again, this is just something that's freely available today. Any citizen in the UK, in the US or otherwise can begin to play with these things. So it's actually getting quite complicated in terms of the information it's providing. If you carry on the conversation even further to say, well, actually, are there alternatives to metformin because actually I'm one of those people that have liver disease or kidney disease, it'll give you even more information around what the possible alternatives might be for you. And many people in this room who treat patients with diabetes will probably understand that actually that's relatively reasonable in terms of what it's providing. But all of that can be massively complicated. And you might say, actually, well, that seems massively complicated. I just don't understand what to do. And not only will it try and empathize with you, but it will recognize that you feel overwhelmed in your language. It will recognize that you feel overwhelmed and then ask you to think about a holistic way and ensure that you engage with your holistic healthcare professional team in tailoring the need to you. So it's safety nets, if you will. It will reason behind your words as you carry on the conversation. Out of curiosity, because many of you are kind of on the policy side, what's the average health literacy, the average health reading age within the US or the UK? Give me, give me a number. Shout as loud as you can. Sixth grade. Sixth grade. So how old is that? Twelve. Twelve. When you think about your medical communication, how much of it is targeted to a 12-year-old? It's an interesting question, right? And I ask that because actually the first time I ever played with this was when my 12-year-old came home with the geography homework about 22 months ago. So I had early access to some of these tools. And his homework was write a 500-word essay on the microclimate of the school 
comparing the field, the playground and the car park of this school in London. And being the heroic father that I am, I could have chosen to go to search engine of choice, type in microclimate, then understand actually is a microclimate different for grass versus mud versus tarmac. Being very lazy, I said, I wrote down my prompt, which was write me a 500 word essay on the microclimate of a school in Northwest London, breaking it down into introduction methodology conclusion, but put it in the voice of a 12 year old. And when it put it in the voice of a 12 year old, not only could I understand it and explain it back to my son, but actually I could have a better conversation with my son. I never gave him the answer because that would be very bad parenting, but I could explain <laughs> it to him on his terms. And so what I've now done in my own clinic is to challenge myself to say, if I'm having conversations with patients about diabetes or heart failure, how do I meet them on their terms and have better conversations? And I'm, when I'm at the MHRA and we look at the risk um, alerts that we get for drugs, often 15 scrolls worth of information, might we be able to actually communicate that better? And these tools are fantastic at summarization and um, communication. Many of us who have done medical school or nursing school, we often learn through clinical vignettes. So if you take a clinical vignette like this, which is from the USMLE talking about a 12 year old girl with a set of symptoms and some early uh, diagnostics, we're often given a multiple choice question. You could take this entire prompt, put it into Copilot today, and it will give you the answer. It'll tell you what the answer is and it will rationalize to you why it is that answer as well. So it's educating, not only giving you the answer, but it, you can prompt it to then educate you as to why you think that answer may well be true and why it possibly can't be any of the others. But remember, that's just a clinical vignette talking about a 12 year old girl with a set of symptoms. What if we push the model a little bit and remind ourselves that actually each of these models have not been trained on any medical knowledge. They've been trained on the digital exhaust of the internet. Um, and they have begun to reason in the background. So the same model is passing the bar exam, passing USMLE examinations, passing MBA exams in the background, and no specialized training. Imagine if we said to it, what do you think the girl in this problem might be thinking and feeling? That requires a significant level of reasoning underneath. And these have not typically been the types of models that we would have been able to have access to in the past, but it will give you a very reasonable answer. As an AI model, I cannot directly assess a person's thoughts and feelings, but I'll make an educated guess. The 12 year old girl in this scenario might be feeling worried and scared. She may be concerned about missing school and it's essential for the healthcare team to address her concerns and provide reassurance. There's been some papers that have been published over the last year around the empathic response that these models are giving, arguably more empathic than some of the practitioners that practice medicine today. Let's go a little bit further even than that. So the girl's name is Meg. If you were Meg's doctor, what would you say in order to provide comfort and support? And it will give you a very, very reasonable script to go in. And when in this, certainly in the UK, and I'm, I'm conscious in the US too, we have lots of role play that takes place. And that role play can be verbal, but you could end up having chat based role play. And if you extend this out and you play with this role play, you could ask the model to assess how well you have done versus other benchmarks. And you could say, I am training to be a doctor. Please role play the role of Meg. I will be the doctor and let's have a conversation on it. And so you'll see how these models are very, very different to any types of technology that we've used in the past and before. And again, freely accessible and available. What I would say, and there was one little bubble in Vivian's chart, which is really, really important, is thinking about how we deploy these tools in a responsible way. So the exam question that I focus on at Microsoft is, how might we transform the practice of medicine with trusted, reliable, human-centered AI? And I say that very deliberately. It's not just about AI. In healthcare, it must be trusted, it has to be reliable, and it has to be human-centered. And there are various tests that you have to pass for trust, tests that you have to pass for reliability. And when we're building models, we think about each of these things. So on a bedrock of transparency and accountability, assessing for fairness, reliability and safety, privacy and security and inclusiveness. Most life science trials that exist on the planet are not representative of people that look like me. I'm a six foot four South Asian guy from Northwest London. Most trials that exist for cholesterol drugs, diabetes drugs are not for me. They're for, for generally 40 year old white men. They're not designed for people like us. We already have bias in our healthcare system. I think that if we were to A, have a conversation about the bias, challenge ourselves and move that we are pushing for um, heterogeneity of data in the development of our models, thinking very carefully about how we deploy these, 
thinking about the end user impact and push ourselves to be much more inclusive around data, where I think organizations like Kaiser can really lead the way, how might we be better at addressing some of these things? We, this will not be a magic bullet, but we will get there over time. Um, and if we can identify issues with the outputs, measure them and mitigate them, we'll be way, way better off. Many of you have seen blood test forms like this. These models are pretty smart. These models can take your blood test form and you can ask it a question and it will give you uh, a response that in simple terms explain this pathology result to me. Saves massive amounts of time, certainly in my primary care clinic where I have to do 42 patients a day, 10 minute appointments each. And what you'll begin to see is what we didn't do at the beginning but we do a lot more now is ground the answers with reference points within the internet. So each of the references you can see underneath and you can go back and validate against them to reduce the hallucinations and confabulations that many of you may have heard of in the past. A lot of that is what's happening on the tech space space. There's research saying how might we be able to actually begin to engage with images in a different way. So what can we do with two-dimensional and three-dimensional images? And I'm sure colleagues will talk in depth about these. But potentially having conversation with the images, if you're in an ER or in an HD or an ITU setting and you can't wait for the radiologist to give you the opinion and the review, could you figure out if there's a pneumothorax here? Could you figure out whether the tube has been placed in the right place? Can you figure out if there's a temporal dimension to the tumor and it's changing over time? And we're getting better at that. In the UK, uh, this is Dr. Raj Jenner on the left-hand side. We engage in a seven-year piece of research with him to think about uh, prostate cancers and radiation oncology, uh, radiotherapy treatment for prostate cancer. It typically takes him from 30 minutes to three hours to contour through every single CT scan, identify tumor versus non-tumor. So in a typical day, he could plan six patients worth of radiotherapy. We've applied uh, open source AI models to that. That takes now 13 minutes. So six patients an hour can now have radiotherapy planning, which means how many more patients will now have potential access to radiotherapy planning for the future. And it's an open source model. He's now adapting that to use it for glioblastomas, head and neck cancers, lung tumors, and others. So we live in a world with massive amounts of information, increasing complexity. We also have a workforce challenge around supply and demand. I think that the doctors of the future and the nurses of the future and the pharmacists of the future, the healthcare professionals of the future that have access to these models and work with these models hand in hand may be safer practitioners than perhaps practitioners that don't use them in the future, is what I would put it to you. Um, and I have a very short video, it's like 45 seconds. Would that be okay to play? So uh, I'm not sure if this is gonna work as well, but we'll give it a go. There's a short video on the left-hand side and I'll try and talk through um, if, if, if it doesn't work out as best as I want it to. Can we try? Oh, here we go. So this is the model, this is demonstrating that these models can see and hear in inverted commas. So this is a model demonstrating what, yeah, demo what you can do with a bike. So this individual is trying to say, help me change my bike seat, move it up and down a little bit. Um, and it will give you the instructions of what you need to do just based on the image. So it recognizes the bike and it recognizes your challenge. And it says to you that if you can give me a more specific picture and give me the manual, I'll help you out even further. And you might say, is this the lever? It'll say, no, that's not the lever. Um, that's the bolt. And it will say, help me identify what you need to do next. So you take a picture of your toolbox, your Allen keys, you take the manual, and it will identify where in the toolbox you need to go, which is the Allen key that you need to use, and what you need to do next. And it does this without any specialized training. I show this because actually these are tools that will be ubiquitous in our day-to-day -day lives. They are not specific to healthcare only. These tools are now democratized around us. It's as if we're living in the iPhone moment, the internet moment. And the question for us, I think, is how do we responsibly um, deploy these? How do we responsibly adopt these and really think about the change management that needs to take place for us to leverage these in a responsible, equitable manner for the future? Um, thank you very, very much. Yes, yes, thank you. I'm going to let you sit here, too. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, two terrific uh, sessions already, and I'm excited to continue. 
Um, I will say that I also have a 12-year-old, and so I think any chat GPT output that doesn't include the use of the word bruh with at least five <laughs> U's is definitely not doing its job and will need some fine-tuning. So that's the easy case where you can easily verify the quality of the output. Um, what I will be talking about, I think, unfortunately, uh, is that the pathway to the future uh, does involve uh, some more complexity that is really happening on the front lines of healthcare delivery organizations that are having to make the decisions of are these tools ready for prime time and what does prime time mean uh, in terms of safety, effectiveness, uh, equity, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so I think you're already seeing a theme of talking about the future really is about talking about where we are in the present. Um, and I'm going to sort of double click down and give you a perspective from our health system. What does this actually look like on the front lines in terms of how we are approaching the challenge of where the tools are today and whether they are ready for wide scale use in our patient population? So where we started this journey was really the need for a vision, right? What are we trying to do with these tools? We don't want to just implement technology for technology's sake. Uh, we really want to ensure that they are solving our real world problems um, and doing so uh, in ways that are trustworthy, um, which again is a, you know, a word that we all kind of intuitively understand, but we have to operationalize that. What does it mean to be trustworthy? Um, and how do we develop processes that ensure that the AI does meet principles of trustworthiness? Um, that includes some of the things that uh, you've already heard about today in terms of longitudinal AI and impact monitoring, so I'll talk about that. Um, and the other piece is AI at scale, uh, that it's really easy to say we have, you know, 2,000 models implemented. Um, what we're really trying to do is to say we don't want 2,000 AI pilots. We really want to figure out which are the tools that are most valuable and get them to enterprise scale so that they can impact our entire patient population. So we are thinking a lot about how do you start with a pilot rapidly determine whether it's doing what it's supposed to do and then have a plan for scaling that so it does get to the enterprise level. Um, so those are really the two dimensions that we are emphasizing, trustworthiness and ability for the tools to get to scale. So we think a lot about this three horizons framework um, in terms of whether we are using our resources around uh, uh, deploying AI effectively. Um, I really like this because I think it's intuitive to think about what is your mature business, what is your rapidly growing near-term business, and what is an emerging future business opportunity, thinking about gas-powered cars, electric-powered cars, and the future of autonomous vehicles. Uh, and the point is we need to be investing on all three horizons, right? We need to make gas-powered cars better, we need to make electric vehicles better, and we need to be designing uh, for this future state. Um, so what does this mean for us in our health system? Uh, it means that right now we are just trying to make our current fee-for-service you know, healthcare system better uh, by um, you know, implementing AI for operational use cases. Again, you heard about some of them already this morning. Um, at the same time, we're thinking about our rapidly growing business. How do we think about generative AI for augmenting clinician intelligence um, and really bringing together the best of human and computer intelligence as that exists today and in the near future? Um, and at the same time, we can start to see a model for AI-driven virtual care, right, where we can get a sense for what might happen with a given patient trajectory, start to anticipate some of the lab tests they may need and send them for lab tests before they even come and see a physician, uh, so, such that that interaction is really fully optimized even before the patient touches our system for a particular issue. Um, and again, there's probably even more opportunities for that future state that we're just still trying to get a handle on. Um, so we are, again, trying to design strategies that will allow us to invest in AI on all three time horizons. Um, it takes a team uh, to do this work well. Um, I don't think we have the answer. Is this the right team? Are we it's the right expertise? Is it the right numbers? Um, we are really all learning this on, on the fly as we do it. Um, at the heart of our operation is our chief health AI officer. I think you see a growing number of health systems that have these roles. Um, and, uh, and they are the sort of data science and, um, and technical team, uh, as well as people with expertise in, um, in, in different sort of domains of clinical informatics. Um, and they oversee our governance process, our technology. And then they're really supported by people in these other roles. Um, so my division is really the group that's being brought in to think about evaluation and impact and measures of, uh, of, of impact. 
Um, and then we have our sort of clinical systems health IT team. Um, uh, we have people who are really thinking on sort of that third horizon in terms of like the research capabilities, doing more of the, the precision medicine work. Um, and um, we have a newly named uh, chief research information officer that's again really pushing us to that third horizon. While, while my group, uh, even though we do research, is a little bit more uh, you know current state. Um, and then, of course, all the IT infrastructure and security um, and our chief data officer that's really trying to work to ensure that we have that solid data foundation uh, that you already heard about today. Um, so I think a lot of what we're going to learn about how to do this work well is who is the team that needs to be at the table? How do you think about the expertise, how they work together? What are the structures and functions? Um, our evolution over time uh, has really started with like what is the technical infrastructure that we need to be able to rapidly deploy different types of AI models. Uh, we're an Epic shop and so we started with Epic's cognitive computing platform um, and pretty quickly realized that it was not going to be sufficient to meet the needs of AI at an academic medical center. Um, so we built basically our own platform that we call HiPAC. Um, that allows a much broader set of data to feed into models in real time. Um, you can again see sort of the basic architecture of it um, and how it integrates with Epic, but also has some um, unique features that again allow us to deploy and monitor uh, our models. Um, where are we today? Uh, we, frankly, even though I think have been at this a while, it's, we are not in the thousands of models deployed. Um, if we look at sort of where we are at an enterprise level scale, we're still in the early days. Um, and we are doing sort of a mix of uh, models that are coming from our electronic health record vendor and a set of models that we have homegrown or self-developed either by people within our health system or by researchers. Um, a lot of these are really still focused on those uh, sort of operational use cases, things like the capacity management that you heard about this morning, um, you know, predicting use of blood products. Um, so again, sort of clinically adjacent and relevant, but they're not predicting diagnoses or sort of directing patients to, you know, to certain parts of our health system uh, yet. Um, we're always evaluating new models, again, mostly driven by the needs of our health system, but with some capacity for what our researchers uh, and frontline clinical faculty are interested in. Um, we have evaluated and turned off models that we thought were problematic um, and uh, have written about sort of that process of trying to uh, understand enough about some of the models that, that uh, were available to us for us to determine whether they met our threshold for sort of being ethical. Um, and, and some of them we felt like they just weren't at our uh, institution's uh, ethical benchmark for, for, for sort of equity of, uh, of deployment. Again, it's a longer story. I'm happy to talk about it at lunch. Um, and then again, a lot of models coming through our pipeline. Um, so again, just to give you a real world sense of sort of, you know, where we are in terms of number of, of models that we're able to, to look at. Um, we also have now GPT integrated, a secure, fully secure version. So no data goes uh, to GPT. So it's sort of our internal product that's integrated with HiPAC um, that I described before. So what that means is that if you want to use a generative AI model uh, as part of the model that you're deploying, it's sort of fully integrated in with the full uh, architecture uh, that then flows down to our EHR. Um, right now, we mostly have GPT-4, um, but are anticipating adding sort of Llama, and you know, we ideally want to move, frankly, to more open source models um, that we can uh, you know, uh, work with in a, in a broader, uh, broader set of ways. Um, if you look at you know, the breadth of applications of healthcare that we hope to touch with AI, uh, it really is you know, moving from that horizon one to the horizon two uh, framework. Um, we're having a really interesting meeting in a couple weeks about how should AI support our medical education mission, right? So should we have virtual AI coaches for all of our trainees? Um, so that as they are going through the process of, uh, of, of training, again, this is across a breadth of different trainee types, they can have real-time feedback on their performance. Right now, it's very labor-intensive. They tell us that they feel like the feedback is delayed um, and, uh, and they don't get enough of it. So is, is AI our solution there? So again, maybe you know, six months from now, you can, uh, we'll be able to tell you where we landed there. But again, just a, a fascinating breadth of conversations. Um, so we are evaluating uh, use cases across all these different domains. Again, we talked about AI, uh, ambient scribes, um, how can we triage high-risk patients. Anyway, you can see down the list. Um, I just want to keep going to get to this last section on uh, this issue of the day around sort of AI fairness. 
um, there was a question that came in. I saw an advance of sort of what can happen at the state level. Um, and I will say that a lot of our work got kicked off by an inquiry that came from our California Attorney General uh, that asked us, how are you assessing uh, your racial and ethnic bias and the algorithms you have deployed? And we said, well, give us a few months and we will let you know. Uh, and really what we realized is that we had to start with even what do we have deployed? At that point in time, we didn't even have a sort of centralized way to know all the different models that existed at UCSF Health. And so we had to sort of come back um, to, uh, to centralize that function and then stand up this whole governance process. Um, so I do think even just the inquiry can be very powerful uh, at the state level uh, to know that someone's looking and wants to know what you're doing uh, before we even get into sort of how do you regulate this and all of that complexity. Um, so as I said, we have adopted uh, a set of trustworthy AI guidelines. Uh, we decided to adopt the HHS uh, guidelines um, because we think that they really do emphasize the key dimensions. Again, so much complexity in how you operationalize this, trade-offs between different dimensions. I don't know that we've got it right, but these are the conversations we need to be having amongst health systems to understand how they're thinking about this. Uh, what we have stood up is what we call our AI Governance Committee. Um, they are the final sort of gatekeeper for what models get deployed to our patients. Um, and so I sit on that committee, a bunch of different people with different expertise, um, and the models, every model, whether that's a research or an operational model or an EHR vendor model, come through the same governance process. Um, and we sit down and we basically look at the models. Um, we start with just discovery, like is this model trying to solve a real problem? Have they thought about the entirety of the solution, not just the model has a high predictive value, but like do they understand how to integrate it into workflow? If we implement it, are we sure that the interventions that will come because of it are equitable? So this whole notion that hasn't come up yet today of, you know, patient positive interventions, right? So if we're going to predict patient no-show, you can either double book that slot, right, which is negative for the patient, and if you have an already biased model, it's going to further worsen disparities. Or you could say if a patient is predicted not to show, um, that we will provide transportation, right? And that's a patient positive intervention. So we're really trying from the start to make sure that we're thinking about implementation of these models holistically and, and sort of how humans will use them and interact with them. Uh, we then do the uh, uh, development and evaluation, retrospective evaluation, prospective evaluation, moving into pilot or RCT, and then the adoption and ongoing monitoring. Um, and what's important about this is it means we're touching these models many, many different times. So this is a huge amount of work just to even take one model through this process. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out now is how do we resource this if we want to be able to put 10, 20, hundreds of models through this process, right? It's a huge amount of investment. Um, anyway, you know, lots of challenges to doing this. I think we're still learning uh, how to do it well. It's something we're trying to do in collaboration with a broad set of partners. So um, if these names aren't familiar to you, I do recommend um, familiarizing yourself with, uh, with, with these groups of organizations that are trying to come together and develop best practices. Um, and as we head towards the end, I'll just say that, you know, I keep coming back to making sure that the models are good and making sure that the humans are good at using the models. And we really have to think about those two pieces uh, together. So yes, we have to think about algorithmic vigilance, algorithmic drift, but we also have to think about clinician vigilance. Is it really realistic to think that if a model gives a clinician bad output, that a human's going to be able to recognize that and capture it and prevent that from getting to the patient? So we're really trying to bring these two together and think about measures and methods for both algorithmic vigilance and clinician vigilance. So happy to talk more about our strategy at the break, but we'll pass it off. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So nice segue to talk about the future, looking at capacity building, especially with clinical vigilance, a lot of... Uh, uh, pitfalls are uh, very tough for me because I say I work in four areas. I'm an associate professor of radiology and informatics at Emory University. And one of them is bias and fairness, which I'm very passionate about. And I'm like, well, maybe I should have talked about my work about that. Or the second one, which is uh, capacity building. And so here are my disclosures. Uh, so 2016, uh, uh, this one godfather of uh, AI said we should stop training radiologists. And this had actually an impact. A lot of students became less interested in pursuing radiology as a specialty. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, it's 2024. 
There's not anyone who has enough radiologists to work for them. And uh, he actually said he's leaving Google to, because of these existential risks of AI. I, I show you this just because uh, we have a lot of uh, hype, even now again with the large language models, that have an impact. They have an impact uh, early from training. You do have to uh, really invest a lot in making sure that the right message gets out, which is actually getting a little more difficult. But uh, I, I want to show you why doing this work again, I, I'm, I'm just following around the same theme that is very, very difficult. So I, I hope some of you or most of you have heard of these two uh, studies, one that shows pulse oximeters doesn't work well for dark um, uh, skinned uh, patients and also the temporal thermometers also don't work as well. And, you know, some of the people who wrote this work are actually very good friends of mine. We do this health equity research using data science together. And I asked them, how has your practice changed? Nothing. You know, they know it doesn't work. These uh, researchers in this space, we know the problem of hidden hypoxemia where you can send patients who really don't have enough oxygen just because of the tools you're measuring. And it's really difficult to translate to practice. And so it's that theme that I'm going to in use to inform sort of like what, we should, what should we be thinking about the future for us? Well, here's an example from a mammography. It's an experimental test. What they did is that they had 50 mammograms and they, share, you know, they changed the output of um, you know, some of the mammograms and then they gave them to readers of different experience. And it turns out that when AI is correct, uh, just uh, unfortunately, if you're colorblind, it's going to be the last uh, bar there, but the red bar is uh, your least ex your in inexperienced reader. So if you give a correct AI output to your inexperienced reader, you improve their performance. And you, know, you raise them up to almost the expert level. But if you give them the, uh, the wrong explanation, in mammograms you can either say the patient has cancer or they really don't have cancer, and you say uh, they have cancer or the other way around, that they have cancer but you say they don't have cancer. And it shows that you even bias your expert performance. And this sort of one of the big future is understanding how does AI and the human, in case we are not anticipating replacement, uh, hold hands together for an impact remains one of the biggest challenges. And uh, here's an example in psychology, they're able to get through a bit for this sort of uh, experiment where they can lie to the reader. And one of them here is just, a, a, they run three experiments uh, with an imaginary use case that is saying one patient has disease, one doesn't have a disease. And what they show is that that when you, one of the experiments always has an error, a systematic error, 40% are always incorrectly classified. And they show when you give AI assistance, the error rate goes up rather than when you just left the human work by themselves. And the second phase, they start off, um, you know, giving one group, the blue one uh, has an error and has, is, uses AI and the down one doesn't. And it shows that you start off with using AI and then you don't. And those, those uh, participants show that when you use AI, your error rate is high. When you stop, uh, it goes down. And then they flip the experiment. For the people who did not use AI, they use the AI in the second phase and they show that the errors persist. I think this study, it wasn't really saying, hey, it's pneumothorax, but to me it was very concerning because it shows that the automation bias can persist even when the AI is withdrawn. We've seen a sort of a system that has actually pulled out AI. And so to me, again, we, you know, I had to still sneak in a, a bias slide here, but it shows that we have a very, very complex uh, system as we start to think about what the future of deployment of these systems is going to be. You have to decide, are you going to think about uh, how you deploy or are you going to think about how you build? We had some comments that, you know, we are building a fair data set. I can tell you that that's impossible. Um, you know, the model, evaluation or how you deploy your system across the complexities of organizations. So um, my talk is around uh, capacity building. I've been involved in many, many years. The first time when uh, Geoffrey Hinton caused a drop in the radiologist's interest in AI, I went back and did a lot of outreach uh, to try to think, how do we educate? Uh, today, I, I run the, the AI elective at, at, at MO University. And what I can tell you is that this field is changing so fast. Today, uh, when I look at my computer scientists versus uh, 
two years ago, they really rely on the computer, science, uh, the computer scientists when it's residents because they have co-pilot that helps them even program. So domain expertise is beca be becoming very important. And so I think one of the biggest takeaways, uh, if I think about the future, even if I don't have a crystal ball, is to think about whose voices are in the room. And to me, that's what policy is as someone who's just learning about how to be in this space. And if you think about epistemic harm, it's the contribution of health equities that is rooted in knowledge itself. It's formation, shape, setup, and effectiveness. And it's em embedded in the knowledge and the ways it, in which it's created and used to exact power. And it really, it's around who gets a seat at the table. And uh, if you see, this is not an imaginary case about whose voices is represented. It's mainly the CEOs of the big companies. And they, they're very far removed, in my opinion, still from the realities of healthcare. And so we see uh, quite optimism that we are going to change how the burnout, you're going to make sure the patients get be health care better. But the person who's left behind is really where, you know, who, the person who's taking care of the patient. And, you know, and I'll show you that sometimes we think about the mental models of how we think about our world, how it should and could be, the way it is, the way it's according to data and the way it's according to model. And now we have uh, according to AI. And the person who's determining how this world is according to AI is very different from the person who's caring for the patient. And so some of the examples, for example, social problems can be fixed by for-profit data-driven solutions. You've had a prior presentation saying maybe we're thinking about open source. Uh, we also have to think about closed models that are open for use that encourage innovation. Uh, we see quite a lot of apps tracking how much you eat, uh, but they don't really think about the underlying complexity of obesity or access to, med you know, to the correct food. And so we see this a lot of technology being uh, postulated as the solution for everything. We also see this focus of an, on effect, you know, efficiency. Today we want to solve doctors' burnout, but I can tell you soon it's going to be how many more patients can you treat and you know, squeezing and squeezing and squeezing uh, the efficiency model. I can tell you um, that uh, we have to think still about what is the value. And also big, you know, thinking about that investment in technology will augment human intelligence more than investment in our fundamental pillars, for example, education, culture, you know, and the institutions. And so it's this gap about uh, where should we put our limited resources and how that is going to, uh, to change the future. And so when I think about uh, can we really, what, what have I learned in my, in my years working in this space, it's really been around learning with others. And that, that's, I can try uh, to tell you what, I, what my thought process has been. And it's this concept that we realize it's very difficult to go through school to change curriculums to really learn okay the kaiser data what 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 are our pitfalls unless you have people working on those data sets and so for a long time we've run this data thon so we bring different experts to work on the data sets and i can tell you some of the realities tend to be oh i didn't realize that my recording of the you know arterial blood gas five minutes later because it's not automatically captured has an impact on how the data are analyzed you know so it's this gap but it turns out with the technology that is getting there, that programming is really, can be done by high school students. We have to really rethink about how do we think about educating and localizing concepts of fairness, ac accountability, transparency, and thinking and moving uh, to these haste camps for how do we think about this concept of discussion around uh, policy. And, you know, this is an example of one that was done in Uganda. I can tell you as someone who does fairness work, uh, I only knew that I'm black when I moved here 10 years ago into the US. And so fairness has a very, very different concept based on where it's done. We know that in Europe, uh, there's a, actually a penalty for social risk classification and social scoring systems. We know that in our country, there's a, a big debate about the work and the not work. And it is getting very, very tough to do this type of work. And so we have to be really intentional in terms of how we are thinking and actualizing and contextualizing what we do and think about policy. So I started uh, off with 2016. Uh, thankfully, I still have a job and uh, the giants are dropping off, but also trying to tell you what has informed uh, really uh, is looking, looking for advice, how should we be thinking about even uh, how we fashion a policy? And I want to leave you uh, with a call for you to emphasize on learning, learning from the past mistakes. Uh, we see a lot of technology being slapped on, uh, for example, EMRs, which all the doctors and the nurses hate. Uh, we, we think about how do we empower this learning workforce and learning healthcare system uh, if we're going to think about policy that doesn't come 10 years later. And then it's this emphasis on these rapid learning cycles. Uh, 
how are we, by the time a paper is published, that's almost like, you know, two or three years down the line from the intervention. How do we encourage, especially learning from failures? And uh, a regrounding, especially from the past, if you think about most of the innovation has been focused on a very small subset. If we are going to envision a future that cares for everyone, uh, we're going to need to do a lot. And so uh, thank you again for the invitation uh, to be part of this presentation. Right, a big round of applause once again for all of our panelists. Thank you so much. So I'm sort of still processing so many messages uh, that came through really strong and um, powerful, and I'm sure the rest of you are too. I think I'll start off by distilling down a lot of what you said and just asking if there's one takeaway you have for our audience um, as they go off and, and do all the important work they're doing related to implementing AI in healthcare. Uh, what would that be? I'll, I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> start with me. Thank you. Um, so, so I, can I have two? Yeah, you can have two. <laughs> so, so, so one is. So I think about um, a two by two matrix, if you will, around risk versus complexity. And if I think about healthcare all up, um, I think the clinical facing use cases that we consider are generally high risk, high complexity work. And like colleagues have described, like Julie and Judy were, were talking. There's a lot of work that needs to be done if we think about the implementation of those. But the business of healthcare may afford us the opportunity to build a muscle on low risk, low complexity kinds mm -hmm. of work. So I wonder how much productivity we might be able to unlock if we think about the impact of these tools in the finance part of our organizations, the HR parts of our organizations, and focus on boring, mundane activities that might unlock hidden potential. Um, so that would be one kind of axis for us to think about. I also would just encourage people to play. Think about what you need to do to build your own experiences and muscle. Don't immediately deploy them into clinical patient-facing tools and services, but just experiment with these models and tools and see what value you can have. Don't think about it as prompt engineering, but think about the act of just posing beautiful questions and seeing what the response might be and focusing on your own, on your own curiosity. I love that advice, and that concept is one I've heard a lot recently, really trying to focus on the, the lower risk, um, but really high impact areas. And then uh, before, I think sometimes we're tempted to kind of dive right into that uh, slightly higher risk area, which can be more challenging. Thank you so much. Julia? Yeah, I think my key takeaway is that we have to do this work collaboratively, and there are many forces that push you to not be collaborative, right? In some ways, the work is so hard and complex that like we can just spend all our time trying to figure out how to get it right for UCSF and really miss the important opportunities to have conversations like the one we're having today. Um, and so I think it's to really sort of push yourself to like come to these events, talk to you know, other organizations like yours, because I think that is really where the rapid learning <laughs> and the uh, sort of avoiding uh, uh, common pitfalls will happen is by doing this collaboratively. And I worry that we don't have enough structures that are forcing that to happen. And we have sort of all the pressures just to stay in the four walls of our org own organizations, optimize for what we're doing locally. Um, so that's, I think, you know, just continue to come to these. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of different coalitions that are trying to put in place those collaborative structures. So just, you know, go to one more of those than you might otherwise, mm -hmm. um, because I think that is really what the key to the future is going to be. What great advice. I was struck hearing UCSF's journey, how similar it was to Kaiser Permanente. So it was really refreshing. Judy, how about you? So uh, in addition to learning, which is what I would say is, uh, is the, my reaction to your comments, is uh, you may not have a choice really in what's coming down. Uh, if you see sort of like every week there's a new policy document or new guidance, uh, we see now uh, every time I go to work, when the Joint Commission is coming to visit, there's even an overhead like the Code Blue announcement that the Joint Commission is here today. Uh, and the Joint Commission is now interested in what you're doing with this. We see, uh, for example, the AG of California is here. And I think that can get very, very overwhelming. So my thing is, uh, to not be afraid to fail and to just get started. And usually I say sometimes it just means picking a simple thing. It doesn't need to be, again, patient-facing and just starting because it shows you so much about your own internal organization. For example, um, the, which GPT should you deploy? Even just that simple thing, you'll find out that there's so many bureaucracies and partnerships between AWS, within Azure, within every cloud provider that's going to spend years for you to solve. So if you think about 
your small experiments as learning and helping you get to a, a pillar that is going to help you to be successful, I think ultimately you're going to be successful. And that also means looking in your own divisions to see what people are doing. Sometimes you're very blinded to what medicine is doing and yet radiology is miles away. And that can be a, an easy way to just get started. I love that. And, and I loved what you shared also about radiology. And, and I think that the lessons from radiology are really a lesson for everyone um, in the room who's in a profession that's been told that AI might ultimately replace them. I think radiology is now the leading medical specialty in publications within artificial intelligence. Um, and I too was in a room uh, many years ago and was told that um, everyone in the room should stand up and wave goodbye to the table of radiologists. So I always like to say, we're still here, right? Sorry about that. <laughs> so such great answers. Um, so I guess I'm gonna get a, a little bit trickier and maybe I'll start with you, Judy. When you're assessing uh, a project to implement, an AI project, how do you determine the ROI? How do you, how do you determine this is the right, the right investment we make, whether it's a pilot that we're gonna scale uh, for Emory? So, um, and, and this is the problem of being a researcher because you can do so many grandiose things without uh, necessary, and kill them without a consequence. Uh, my work has always been really to think about how AI works. Does it really bring value? So anything that I, I, I stopped moving from diagnostic models quite early in my career, although I'll tell you that I'm back there for one reason, uh, is because I felt that, and, and really even the research now shows that you don't really get a lot of efficiency gains when you use AI. You save radiologists maybe an hour or two. Like it's, it's really not worth all that investment. And so the thing that I have come to when I pick a project, uh, I do obviously have a lot of students, so I look at the learning opportunity. But also when, it, when I think about the value for healthcare, I look at what is, going, what is it going to do. And living um, in this gray area, which is our AI world, is something that everyone in this room has to be. And the reason for that is, for example, one of my lessons this year is that all the metrics that we use for AUCs they're useless when it comes to a radiologist, how I use AI. And it took me a long time to come to that because what I want to know is if I'm looking at this chest X-ray, is the AI usually right or wrong? And that's almost like a positive predictive value or a negative predictive value, which I never ever reported and I would never use those to buy. I wanna know if I'm going to hedge and say correlate clinically, how forceful am I going to come down? And so to me, I feel that the personalized metrics are a little off. The second area as someone who works in health equity is that the metrics are all over the place and really don't translate to outcomes. So I love the word clinical vigilance because if you give me a model that performs at 56% ejection fraction versus 55% ejection fraction, to me, they're kind of a little bit the same. It doesn't make sense to keep tuning and tuning because I'm not gonna change my management. And so that bridge to outcome and that bridge to personalization is how today I'm thinking about it, but that's also an evolving process over this uh, time. So I said uh, that I'm gonna come back to the predictive model that just came back from home in Africa, and the quality of care still needs to get better. And in that place, I really should be building predictive models and more predictive models. Great, thanks, Judy. Julia, how about you at UCSF? How do you determine whether to make an investment in a new technology or use case? Yeah, I mean, I'll agree that like we are not doing traditional ROI calculations because I think we don't have the uh, investment piece well-defined and we don't have the return piece well-defined. We're still trying to figure out just what are the right metrics to assess. Um, but I think we are starting, as has come up before, with like the use cases that are in your sort of high-value, low-complexity bucket, the, what we call keyboard liberation, I'd say, is mostly our focus um, and, and where we're just convinced that there is a return on investment because we know that our clinicians want to be doing less documentation and we've seen the performance of the tools and I think are pretty convinced that they are good enough for scaled deployment. Um, so I think right now it's, we are, it's almost more of a sense <laughs> that there is an ROI there rather than like a traditional calculation. And I think it'll get more and more complicated as we move into some of those sort of, uh, you know, second and third horizon to think about what are the right metrics uh, to, you know, to assess in particular the, the benefits. I think we'll get a better handle on the cost, but I think that benefit one is tricky because there's lots of different dimension of benefit. There's also going to be risk in there. Um, so I don't see that we're going to use sort of hard and fast ROI calculations and threshold for decision-making in the near term. 
Julia, could you talk a little bit more for our audience about what those tools are to really help with physician? Because some of them may not be as familiar with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'd say the two that we are uh, focusing on, again, at the scale benchmark are like ambient, uh, dic uh, you know, basically an AI scribe. So it is uh, something that sits in the exam room, listens to the interaction between the clinician and the patient, and then generates the draft note for the clinician to review, edit, and then that goes in. So it's still a human in the loop. It's not sort of fully autonomous. Um, but again, we've seen just even in the last year that the tools are, I think, maturing quite quickly. Um, I'll also note we're going to pilot two different tools to see which one our clinicians like better uh, and are partnering with uh, another health system that's going to pilot one of the same tools and then a third tool. And our goal then is to put together the results of the two pilots to basically be able to do an A to B to C comparison. So again, this is where I think the collaborative work can really uh, be uh, valuable. The other thing we're turning on is GPT response to inbox messages. Uh, we know that our clinicians are mostly feeling crushed by the volume of patient messages that they're getting, and we don't want to turn that off. Um, but if we can make those a little bit faster and more efficient by offering them a pre-populated draft of a response, then that, I think, is, is a win-win. Um, but again, are they going to take the time to edit it? Will they catch a hallucination? You know, these are some of the risks of turning on these models. Um, so we're also trying to sort of val you know, validate and make sure that they are sort of clinically ready across a breadth of scenarios. I love that. And our radiologists have been using um, sort of GPT-generated responses in their impressions of their radiology reports. And one of the things that we hear is just how much that cognitive burden is really decreased when they're using that generative AI for just a small part of their report. So after a long shift, they're able to, you know, go out to the gym, uh, drive their kids around, whereas before they would have just crashed in their bed. Um, so I'm curious, Julia, what sort of response have physicians been giving uh, to these to this technology work you've been implementing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly what you said. It's not necessarily a huge time reduction. I think you mentioned this too, but it is less cognitive work um, and it is more empathetic. And, you know, so it's, I think our sense is that, you know, that, that it is relieving some of the, the burden. Um, uh, again, it's we're really early on in the journey and, you know, we're going to measure and monitor like which clinicians are continuing to use it. You can turn it off and stop using it. Um, so I think once it's sort of out there at scale, we'll really understand, you know, who's finding it beneficial who's not and like what explains that. Um, but I think for now, there's a lot of interest in, in the tools. I'll just note, I'm personally very curious uh, because some of our clinicians have started to say, well, the GPT might say, I recommend you come in for a visit, mm -hmm. right? And then does that shift the physician's propensity to say, actually, yes, I agree. I think that patient should come in for a visit or not. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of sort of nudges and other pieces of these. So again, it's just why when we talk about the thinking about the outcomes and impact, you have to take just such a broad set of measures mm -hmm. so they could tell us it is, you know, less cognitively burdensome or it isn't saving time. And like, we're going to have to put this all together and say, like, is this the win that we want or not? And it's just, it's very complicated to kind of make that final call in terms of like whether the tool is doing what we thought it would. Wonderful. And I do think it's interesting how the areas you focused on, it's been same with KP, are the areas that um, have the biggest bang for the buck for our people. Because I do feel that our, you know, our people, and I'm hearing that from you as well, are really our greatest resource. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Sinead, talk about, you're looking at it from a different angle, right? Not necessarily care delivery, but from Microsoft. How does your company determine where that, those investment dollars should go? So from a health and life sciences perspective, I sit on the R&D side of Microsoft. And what we don't do is say research for hire, but we do think about actually what are the biggest problems and challenges that, that we could try and address. And so if I think about that exam question on how might we transform the practice of medicine with trusted, reliable, human-centered AI, you could do lots and lots of things, right? You could choose to work provider-centric. You could choose to work in drug discovery, in drug development, or and across the entire continuum. And when we think about where we're going to spend our time, resource, and focus, it has to be on problems, ideally, that nobody else has solved before. So we think about the Horizon 3 category that Julia was referencing, and we think about those deep, deep problems that can have transformative impact and move the needle on an industry, but can also have real-world impact and almost think about almost a public value proposition, if you will. And if we were to do this, what would be the total impact on society that aligns with the broader mission around empowering everybody to achieve more? So there's some, some things I could probably share, perhaps over lunch, certain things I can't talk about publicly just yet. Um, but we get a chance to really explore with these novel tools what the art of the possible might be. We, we kill way more things than we actually then deploy into practice. But things like that radiotherapy planning tool, for example, there's something that could tangibly make a difference from a three-hour interaction to a 13-minute interaction 
adds both productivity, reduces the cognitive load, but also has a deep and meaningful impact on uh, cancer potential outcomes is, are the kinds of work that we like to do. Wonderful. And um, I'll, I'll put it back to you. What are you most excited about as you look at this next year? What is the, sort of the big things we should be on the lookout for? Um, so I, I, can I go a bit longer than a year? Because sure, yeah. I, I, think, I think in a year's time, I would hope that organizations such as yourselves, Emory, UCSF, have become a lot more confident on where these tools can really work and where actually you need more evidence to deploy them in a meaningful way. But if we kind of extend it out a little bit, people talk a lot about this notion of precision medicine. I think we live in a, in a world where we practice medicine on a lot of averages. We discussed earlier the challenges around equity, fairness and others. Can we push ourselves to be better on that? And could we move to a future where we have more precision diagnostics, more precision therapeutics, more precision ambient intelligence that allows my practice of medicine to change mm -hmm. and allows me to actually practice in a future that allows me to be much more precise over time and way less focused on averages. And if I had access to information, when, so I work in primary care, so very different to secondary care settings, but if I knew not only what's in my medical record, but I knew more details around genotype, phenotype, environment, social circumstances, if you will, I think I could really offer better care to the patients and public that I serve as a consequence of that. And I think that's the future that we might be able to enable if we, if we make the right choices now for the future. So you're talking about within genomics and pharma and targeted treatments? All of the above. Okay, great. I like that. Julia, how about you? What are you most excited about? And you can go beyond a year also. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like at the most conceptual level, I am excited for the moment when our care teams, our patients say, like, we love this technology. It is making healthcare better. I mean, I just feel like we've been talking about the promise for now, like, decades, and it felt, it's felt like it's continued to fall short. Um, and I just, I really do think that in the next few years, we're going to have that breakthrough moment where we're, the technology is going to start working for us better. It's going to make, you know, the whole process feel more efficient, safer, you know, like it's really putting our people, as you said, at the center. Um, and, and it just, I just think that will be such a, a, a satisfying moment because we've been putting in so much time and effort, right? So much data has gone into these systems. It feels like, well, what, what are we really doing with it? Is it adding value? Um, and I think we're going to start to see it really feel tangible, that, that value moment. And then we're going to get to do so much more exciting stuff because we'll have sort of won back the hearts and minds of the people. Um, and they will then say, okay, I, I do love my EHR as much as I love my iPhone, right? Like that will be a huge moment. Wow. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that's one to on two that years, <laughs> but like, I mean, I really do feel like we're start, it's starting to feel like we're flipping towards that. Um, and I just think that's going to be such an exciting moment. Um, again, a lot of hard work still to get there. I don't want to trivialize it, but since you asked what I'm excited about, it, it is really that moment in the sense that it is finally starting to be on the horizon. I love that. I'm getting chills as you're talking about it because I also feel that coming. <laughs> Judy, how about you? What are you most excited about? Um, I think um, two things. Uh, one is we're going to an election year, and I think we're seeing quite a lot of generative AI uses beyond healthcare. And I think they're going to serve as a big lesson to the potential and the harms of this technology. So we're going to what, what the hype cycle does. Um, I think as of today, I saw, for example, the meta uh, toolkit that was done to show this is AI generated, did not work, was broken down in a few hours. And it's going to really show the complexity of working in this, in this space, not just for healthcare, for just general business. And that's going, uh, I think, to ground or move some general policies, for example, health AI, AI literacy for the population, even if it's at a sixth grade level. And so I think we're going to see those societal changes, and that's going to be good to allow the hard work to continue, for example, in mission critical areas like defense and healthcare. And then the, personally, I'm very, very excited about the potential of using AI as a hypothesis generation. And when I think about if I had all the data at Kaiser, that's what I would do. And the reason for this is that AI has amazing uh, abilities to pick up trends that are not very obvious to us, that would take for us years to come up with hypotheses, not just uh, for, for patient care, but just our practice. I'll give you an example as uh, someone who does radiology AI. From a chest X-ray today, I can tell you the, the image-based age of the patient, the race of the patient, their 
uh, cardiac uh, ICD codes, their healthcare costs with amazing ability and even a mark of kind of where they live when you think about the area deprivation index. And those things, if you have to hire the biggest workforce to do that underwriting for you, would be impossible. It has tremendous opportunity for harm uh, because you can say, I'm not going to cover this group of patients. But if imaging only, there's more to an image and we can harness that from AI, this is, to me, much more important than ever augmenting a radiologist, and I hope that we're going to see some of these bold population-based use cases and opportunistic screening as something that I'm very excited about. I love that, and I'm really excited about the role of AI within um, women's health, especially in the breast cancer screening end-to-end -end mm -hmm. sort of diagnosis. So thank you so much. So I think now we'll, we'll open it up to our audience and see if we have any questions from you all. I'm sure you have uh, several. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is an amazing forum. I'm so happy to be here. Amy Anderson, I'm with Oracle Health. And I just want to thank the clinicians and researchers for grounding this discussion where it should be. Um, I spend a lot of my time within Oracle, you know, engaging with, with, with our leaders around um, sort of first principles. It's about, this is a, I loved how um, Vivian mentioned, you know, people caring for people, and that's really what we need to focus on. I think um, what I learned from this forum, particularly, is the importance of really looking at the delivery of care, how data can inform, and then where do we, where do we apply our priorities for AI? We hear this all the time from our customers. Um, where do we start, right? And I, I'm really... Um, passionate about looking at um, sort of how can we enable the standard of care and practice, which we know is evolving all the time. And, and I think the, the highlights that you have, have mentioned, particularly around the clinical experience, is what are those, what are those um, roadblocks, right? So we see with personalized medicine in particular, um, the increasing use of NGS, right? However, what we know from clinicians is those NGS reports are not necessarily helpful in and of themselves. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing is working with um, some innovative companies that are applying, um, you know, AI to those um, tests in order to deliver insights that are, um, based on, you know, evidence. So I love this. I love kind of thinking about, you know, being practical innovators and, and also ensuring that we have the ethical um, guide, you know, guideposts for us. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm not sure if there was a question, but um, mm -hmm. you could, I would just, I will just latch onto one word you said, which is roadblocks. So, um, and, and I, I think that I do want folks to leave here knowing that sometimes there's roadblocks um, almost all the time in terms of implementing them. And I don't know if I could put that to the panelists because I think it's a great question. Um, what are the biggest roadblocks you've seen in terms of, and, and obviously you're going to come at it from a different angle, but in terms of trying to get this technology out and, to be used? So, I, so maybe I can answer it from some of my NHS experience, if Perfect. you will, right? Wonderful. So. Um, Implementing any change is extraordinarily difficult, right? From the simplest thing that you have to, to think about doing. And even if you believe it the right, it's the right thing to do, do all of your stakeholders believe it's the right thing to do? So we've, at the, the hospital that I sit on the board of, we implemented Epic pre-pandemic, um, massive investment, really good change management. And the change management investment actually paid massive dividends because it took the clinical workforce and the non-clinical workforce alongside. And I think where I've seen things fail is when the change management hasn't been considered. And you just say, hey, deploy this thing and you'll reap the benefits, won't you? And they haven't taken the entire um, multiple tribes that exist within any given healthcare system along that journey with you. But making, understanding that change is hard and understanding that you have to get stakeholder buy-in and understanding that you can um, start off with some uh, relatively small, meaningful, impactful projects in a view to getting onto more complex things is probably the journey that I would encourage people to consider. And the NHS has multiple, multiple instances of where things have failed over time. So learn from others and experience from others too. 
I love that. So change management, absolutely yeah. critical with this. Julia, how about you? What roadblocks do you see being sort of the most significant? I mean, I frankly would say I don't think that there are true roadblocks in terms of things that are stopping us. I think what there are are speed bumps. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to decide how much to slow down as we see them. So probably the hardest things are like safety and equity. Right, as we look at a tool, like what is the actual performance on safety and on equity that is good enough to deploy, right? And then you have to just have really complex, nuanced conversations about like what is the current state, right? Because it may be inequitable, but as long as it's better than the current state, like, is that good enough? Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like you get very quickly into sort of ethics and ethical discussions. And then I will just say on our AI governance committee, it feels like, are we really well equipped to make these decisions? You know, I'm not an ethicist. And, you know, so I just think that that is where it's like how sort of slow or quickly to move is, is really to me what feels like the hardest and scariest part of, of these decisions, um, right? Because it's sort of one, you know, one wrong word in a gen AI message that goes back to a patient could really be life or death. And like, we are the final arbiter of whether that model should go forward or not. So the stakes feel very high. Um, but yet, if there's broad value to that tool, we don't want that one, you know, possibility of one thing going wrong to stop us. So it's, I'd, I'd say it's those that are, to me, feel like the biggest um, challenges right now. Thank you, Julia. Judy, how about you? Um, I'm going to uh, just respond to this as opportunity. What's the opportunity? Uh, today and uh, first of all you should have a team and you should staff it and provide the resources that you need for it. Um, I think we are missing the patient voice and this is because we're trying to reinvent how to communicate results to patients and um, I, I believe that there's quite a lot of opportunity to have early engagement. For example, if you show me that GPT will be used for a rare disease diagnosis, then you know the realities of patient privacy or anonymizing someone with a very, very rare condition is nearly impossible. Yet those are the same group of patients that can benefit a lot. We see a lot of patient advocacy groups for those patients with rare diseases, but they are completely or, you know, not at the table. And I think that if we can engage them, I think we're going to mitigate some of the risks downstream because we will you know, be very uh, forward with what worked, what failed. And um, I think it's just a blind spot to most of us. And then the other surprising thing for me is uh, watching this, we've deployed two systems for radiology at Emory, is the human factors. And, and I think we underestimate what that will look like. Uh, for example, one of these is a triage algorithm. We know our, our patients are long, long, long. Uh, you don't want to be sitting on a patient with a bleed when you should have read their study early. But showing people where they missed uh, where they, um, you know, and documenting them has a tremendous impact of even how you deploy the system because is this discoverable? Are you going to start to say Judy misses a lot of these cases all the time? Maybe she's not a good radiologist when it comes to review me in my annual uh, feedback. Uh, you know, you're going to say who else knows? And that can have such negative consequences that some people say we don't want you to deploy it. So the technology, I do believe, with the arms race will get better, but the human factors and the human side is really, really behind and is underestimated in the success uh, of this technology deployment. Thank you. I think you can see why these are all such seasoned leaders. We went from roadblocks to change management to speed bumps to opportunities. So. <laughs> all right, great. And any other questions? I see a couple of hands. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to turn this on. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Neil Carpenter, Redesign Health and Tau Ventures. Um, let me just kind of change the level of question, if we can, for just a second. A lot of how we've been talking about this is from sort of inside the care delivery system out. So let me ask a very different question, is if we sort of took a step back to a societal level, because this is like game-changing technology, and said, from, as a society, how do we need to think, what is something the healthcare system could do differently with this technology that'd be beneficial to society, which is kind of above the clinician, above a specific patient, above an administrator, above a P&L, what is maybe one thing that it could do in the next five to 10 years? Well, that's a very easy question, so I'm gonna turn <laughs> up. <laughs> Judy, I'll start with you. Just this, which um, uh, So this is society. Um, I would say that when I flew yesterday through Atlanta Airport, one of the busiest airports in the world, I see a lot of digitization, digital ID, clear TSA pre, I think we are underestimating displacement of jobs. And I think we should be looking at what that future is going to look like 
are not replacement, but there will be, I can tell you that in five years when I go through TSA to boarding, that there'll be very, very minimal human contact. It's very clear that you can see that this is going to happen. But we are not thinking about how to educate today our students uh, to live in this world where they can search online and get the answers. What are those important skills to build uh, the next generation workforce uh, is what I would spend my money on today. Hmm. Wonderful. Julia? Are we getting signaled? Am I going to escape with our time's up or should I go ahead? You know what? I think that's the perfect place to stop. TSA. <laughs> Since we're all dealing with the TSA. All right. Great. Well, thank you once again for all of you for being, I think, so honest, uh, really, with the problems you're dealing with and also being very brave and paving the way for the rest of us. So thank you. A big round of applause for our panelists. Oh, great. All right, huge thank you to Dr. McLean and our panelists for such an interesting conversation. We are going to transition now to lunch, which is going to be served in the very back, buffet style. We encourage you to bring your lunch back to your tables, or for those of you not seated at a table, there are tables near the, the uh, buffet area. And please do be back in your seat on time. We will start right at 1230. Thank you. All right, so our final panel today focuses on addressing risk at risks and harnessing benefits of AI in healthcare through policy and practice. I'm so excited about this panel. Um, and I'm very excited that Dr. Daniel Yang will be moderating. And we have also asked him to share some closing reflections after the panel as well. So Dr. Yang recently joined Kaiser Permanente as our new Vice President for Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technologies. And in this role, yes, people are clapping. We're very excited, yes. Um, in this role, he's responsible for ensuring oversight for all AI applications for the organization across clinical operations, research, education, and administrative functions. Before joining Kaiser Permanente, he was a program director at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation where he founded and led a philanthropic program on diagnostic excellence. In this role, he helped establish several public-private partnerships to promote responsible use of AI in healthcare. He created infrastructure to support development, implementation, and evaluation of diagnostic AI algorithms. And he advanced research methods for evaluating clinical impact of AI in real-world settings. Dr. Yang is also a practicing internal medicine physician, and he completed his residency at UCSF and a fellowship in healthcare systems design at Stanford. Dr. Yang, I'll pass it to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm really excited to, to just be here at this event. I feel like um, it's a homecoming in many ways. I'm able to connect with all my KP colleagues I've been seeing on Teams in these little boxes. And to see them in person is remarkable and really just understand the, the national impact and footprint of this organization. And two, I, I just see so many familiar friends and colleagues that I've gotten to know over the years um, in the audience, on the stage. Um, so for me, this is really kind of bringing these two worlds together uh, to talk about a topic that I think we're all passionate about, which is uh, ensuring that we're deploying AI in a way that's responsible. Um, I'm really excited to be joined on this stage by three people that I admire um, that bring complementary perspectives and expertise to this topic, particularly as we think about the risks and benefits of AI and what that means for policy and practice. The theme for the discussion is really how do we move from what we know we should be doing to actually getting it done. And so let me introduce my speakers. I'm not going to embarrass you the way that uh, Rebecca embarrassed me with my, my whole bio. Um, I'm just going to provide some you know, uh, key bullet points uh, to provide context of, of where you're coming from um, and the expertise that you bring. So first, we'll, uh, we have Tom Romanoff, who is the director of the technology project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Now, prior to working at BPC, Tom led IT initiatives for several federal agencies and advised executive leadership on the impact of new and emerging technologies on government operations. 
Second, we have Laura Adams, who is special advisor at the National Academy of Medicine, where she leads the development of an AI code of conduct. Prior to NAM, Laura was a president and CEO of the Rhode Island Quality Institute and has been a longtime expert in healthcare data interoperability. And last but not least, we're joined by Dr. Maya Hightower, who is co-founder and CEO of Equality AI, which helps data scientists develop fair and unbiased algorithms to eliminate discrimination in ML models. Prior to Equality AI, uh, Dr. Hightower was a physician executive at multiple academic medical centers. Most recently, she was EVP and Chief Digital Transformation Officer at the University of Chicago, and she was also the Chief Medical Information Officer at both the University of Utah and also at the University of Iowa. So um, just a quick note on how I plan to run this panel. It'll be slightly different than the last panel. Um, I'm going to bring up each panelist to provide some uh, remarks. But as I'm bringing them up, I'm going to channel the thoughts and questions, what I think the audience has in their mind. Um, and after, I, after each of the panelists finish their remarks, I'm going to open it up for the other panelists to kind of function as a quick reactor panel. And then after we get through each of their remarks, we'll just open it up to a more general moderated discussion and finally for an open Q&A. So uh, Tom, uh, you'll be our first speaker. Um, and so as you're coming to the podium, here's what I think the audience is thinking about in their head. The current policy landscape for AI is messy. We've got guidance from the FDA on AI-enabled clinical decision support tool. We've got the final rule recently released from the ONC on predicting decision support interventions. We've got the White House executive order on AI. We've also got state level efforts. We heard about the California Attorney General letter. So can you help us clarify the current policy and regulatory landscape for health AI? What are the key issues? And what can we learn from AI policy approaches in other areas outside of healthcare and in other settings outside the United States? So Tom, please. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon. Some easy questions there, um, and I will do my best to address them, but also uh, fully aware that it's after lunch, so if you need to take a nap or anything like that, uh, you know, I, I, won't, I won't fault you for it. But, you know, just beginning with, uh, you know, uh, who I am, I'm the director of the Technology Project, and to answer Dan's question about the landscape, um, it is messy. Um, we have seen a lot of interest in AI over the last couple of uh, last couple of months, couple of years, um, and you know, in Congress, we're looking at around 43 different uh, AI-related bills. A uh, number of executive orders that are up there uh, all apply to artificial intelligence, and we haven't even started talking about the state-level uh, legislation framework. Um, what we're seeing is that um, you know, AI has uh, has been around for a while. Uh, this, folks that have been working with this technology know that. There's not, you know, there's new products out there, uh, but the technology itself is fairly known in a software development world. Uh, but there's new applications, and we're just now catching the attention of policymakers on how those applications are being used um, in ways that, uh, you know, frankly have some serious concerns. So when I say that AI is not new, uh, just to put it in context, okay? So in 1956, the concept about AI and the mathematical equation that um, led to what we have today was first conceptualized. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see from 1956 to today, there's been a number of different advances. And it's always been that way with this technology, where the technology advances a little bit, and then people start to freak out. Are we having a superhuman intelligence? Is, how is this going to put everybody out of a job? Um, it also doesn't help that sci-fi uh, has oftentimes pointed to artificial intelligence as the, the villain, right? So uh, I can't get through an AI presentation without mentioning the Terminator. Um, and, um, you know, in some ways, you know, you can conceptualize a path forward towards, you know, uh, AI being able to um, do a lot that we think of as sentient, but uh, the clear path is not there yet. Um, and so whenever somebody asks, how many years are we away from superhuman uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I don't even put it on a time scale. Uh, but what I do want to say is that what we are seeing now uh, means that we can't go back to the way that things were pre-chat GPT or pre-large language models. Uh, the, the genie is out of the bottle, uh, Pandora's box is open, um, and... Um, 
you know, putting it also into context of where we were uh, on a global scale, um, you know, in the last two or three years, I pointed to state level legislatures and some congressional AI bills that are out there. Um, you mentioned some of the healthcare specific ones. But if you can see, it, there's been a lot of talk. Um, this graph goes all the way back to 2016 around how to strategize around AI, how to regulate it. Uh, 2016 is when a lot of the militaries uh, all agreed that uh, they would not use uh, autonomous weapons uh, against each other. Um, and some of those militaries included China and uh, the United States. Um, but what, I'm, what I want to convey here is that um, no one's really pointing to these uh, agreements or these publications and saying, look at the history here. Look at how much we've already been thinking about AI. By and large, these are all forgotten, and I will put my organization's efforts in 2019, we put out a national strategy. No, no reporters are calling me up about the national strategy we put out in 2020. Uh, it's okay, I'm a little hurt by it, but it's fine. Um, and so, you know, when uh, one of the speakers was talking about how do we localize AI, I think this is a really good example because the other thing I want to convey is that you know, AI is a reflection, in this case with ChatGPT, of language and how we use language. Um, it's, and language often has kind of that anthropological uh, effect of, you know, reflecting how, you know, certain cultures think or religions uh, practice or whatever it might be. So localizing AI is going to be exceptionally difficult because uh, on a global scale, we, we, we don't have common thinking about how to regulate this AI or what is a common definition of fair or what is a common definition of equity and access. And I say that as a pragmatic point of view, not as a um, kind of uh, general, you know, I, I can point to what I think of as fair in practice, but you know, I do realize and recognize that there's other definitions out there. And so uh, with that, I just want to also point out that, you know, we are in a new era, right? And um, so what is different now? Um, so this thing called Moore's Law, where you have exponential growth um, in compute and memory and all that fun stuff, uh, is leading to a lot of uh, what we're seeing in kind of these uh, incremental advances in AI. At the same time, if you look at the graph at the right, we're seeing uh, increased, uh, increased connectivity. IoT uh, devices are nearly universal in the United States, and they're growing. Um, they're expected to continue to grow through 2030. Um, and so we have a lot of data out there. And all that data is, from a human perspective, really difficult to recognize those patterns to, to create um, you know, predictions. But AI is an excellent prediction machine. That's also a really good book if you want to read something on that. Um, and um, it's also something that I, I like to convey is called exponential growth being very difficult for humans to understand. Um, and so while we're talking about this, uh, how to regulate and how to make it safe in, in healthcare, today it's already grown uh, by leaps and bounds. And exponential growth is a concept that humans just really can't wrap their heads around. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of, so a good example again is ChatGPT. So when it comes to exponential growth, it's always, they're, they're finding new products for it. They're finding new ways to, to make it learn. Um, somebody mentioned about, you know, uh, having ChatGPT write a poem or whatever it might be. Well, the other example I want to use is ChatGPT, when it first came out, I don't want to know how many hands go up on this, but how many of you actually went in there and said, let me see if it can do my job a little bit better than, than I can do it, right? Let me see if it can write a outline for something I want to write or whatever it might be. And then you got the product and it wasn't that great. There was something you needed to go fix. And you're like, whew. I got another two years until the technology captures up and it's better than mine, right? But that two years is coming. Um, and, um, you know, what I like to say in terms of job disruption in this space is that um, what is cognitively very hard for human beings is very easy for AI to do, and vice versa. What's cognitively very easy for us to do is very hard for the AI to do. And so that's why you're starting to see people use it as a first draft and then go in and use their experience to try to... Um, build it out. Um, and along those, the, that point, Goldman Sachs came out with a really scary report, if you haven't seen it, uh, that you know, the current iteration of AI will raise GDP by uh, 7%, but it'll also impact over 300 million jobs over time. Whew, I only have two minutes. Let me hurry up. All right. So, um, problem not solved. All right. 
So what does this mean? So if in, in the health equity space and, and, and this idea of, um, you know, by data bias, people have been working on this for a long time. If you are following the big data trends and how to use it in, in the medical space, uh, data bias was big in that. AI is kind of magnifying those issues. It's going to amplify a lot of that because it can do things at scale that we haven't been able to do. Um, and so along those same lines, and I tell this to policymakers a lot, is that if you cared about data, uh, data bias in the, uh, in the healthcare space or equity in the healthcare space or social safety nets to uh, mediate technology disruption, then you probably care about it as well in the AI space. Nothing has really changed there. It's just really going to continue to amplify. I'm hurrying up because I only have a minute and 20 seconds. Sorry. Um, so now getting into the policy conversations. Are the policy solutions justified in some of these scary things? Well, um, you know, we have uh, policymakers have some bright lines that they don't want to cross. Uh, mis and disinformation in the election space. Um, you know, uh, making sure that it doesn't exaggerate, uh, exaggerate uh, existing biases. Um, and um, in, the, in the context of that, we often find ourselves looking at what other countries are doing. So the European Union has been called the Silicon Valley of regulations. Um, and that's because they're going ahead and they're going to go regulate. They put out the, the AI Act. Um, and, um, and then in, in the United States, that has led to this debate around what do you do around innovation where, you know, inno folks will argue that innovation uh, can't thrive in regulatory environments. Um, but then what do you do about things like deep fakes and bias and jobs, job issues? Um, and then finally, at the same time, we're having this big debate on what competition with folks like China means. Um, and so all of these things are pieces that uh, policymakers are trying to put together. In the healthcare space specifically, uh, I'm going to run over a little bit, if that's okay. Um, I just want to talk, you'll see that, you know, there's kind of two different worlds. Patients are scared of AI in some situations. Uh, they don't want to see it rolled out too quickly without the safety norms in there. Uh, but at the same time, healthcare is viewed as one of the biggest areas of disruption for this technology, uh, one of the biggest opportunities for cost savings. Um, and so as you see these kind of um, these things play out in the industry, the idea of trust is really hard in this space because um, take, for example, facial recognition, right? Facial recognition is something that they rolled out in the UK specifically, and it did not do well with people of color or people of East Asian descent. Um, it was very inaccurate. And that idea of AI, facial recognition is AI, being inaccurate persists today. Even though the technology has continued to excel, once you've lost that trust, it's really hard to gain it back. And when I say you've lost that trust in the facial recognition space, I like to say it's Kleenex versus facial, uh, facial tissues, right? Um, AI is AI to anybody who's not, you know, in this field practicing it. And so if there's some, a group that doesn't trust it because of the outputs that happen in facial recognition, they probably won't trust it in their healthcare space. And so the idea that we need to regulate across these things, it's dangerous because we see AI as kind of this one big thing that we need to, to, to tackle. Uh, but in reality, there's very specific industry um, considerations that need to be taken into account. There's some very smart people that need to step up in those industries to make sure that they are um, you know, providing the context needed for uh, AI in that space and how it's being used. Um, and so what I usually tell folks is you know, regulating by use case is really easy, but it's also really hard to do in terms of long term. and um, you also need to address these problems early. So with that, I've run over a little bit, and I would like to thank you. All right. So um, first, let me um, open it up for a reactors, uh, reactions from both Maya and Laura. So feel free to, if you have any thoughts that you wanted to provide, I'd uh, love to hear them. Yeah. How far away are we from some meaningful regulation? So comprehensive AI uh, regulation is something that uh, we talked a lot about last year with the AI innovation forums. Um, those have largely lost a lot of steam, um, and a lot of members on the House and, and Senate side uh, have been given permission to engage folks on their committee specialization or their 
bosses specific areas of um, of interest, and that means that a lot of the AI legislation potentially happening will be around some of those use cases like mis and disinformation, deep fakes, things like that, instead of a comprehensive uh, type of uh, approach that you know, potentially was being floated when they did the innovation side. Now, it's still not dead yet, but um, you know, I don't see it happening in the 118th, and that's always dangerous to make <laughs> predictions about what Congress is gonna do in this space, but uh, I think smart money is not in the 18th, maybe the 19th, but we'll continue to see states regulate in that space including in the healthcare applications. You'll continue to see the federal government push out, uh, whether it be rule changes, executive orders. There's one that happened last week around um, privacy, which will have an impact on AI. Um, and uh, so you'll see that, see that. The problem with that approach is that um, with the executive order, uh, it's subject to a new executive coming in and saying they don't want to go that direction. And it's really expensive to change directions in this space. Um, and then at the state level, it's really hard to manage technology with the patchwork. Yeah, Tom, I thought you did a fantastic overview of that. And it does give us the sense of the complexity. And especially when we think about trying to harmonize this globally, because I think what we understand across the globe is that um, the threats don't stop at the border. And I think we don't want innovation stopped at the border either. So I think there's an incentive for us to get out and do that and to act collectively, globally, and I guess I would, seeking some advice from you, I've just been asked to do a, um, to chair a global innovations group out of a UK regulatory science and innovation network there. Uh, who would you invite to the table for a global innovations view to assist the UK and also cross-fertilize for the rest of the nations? Uh, so, um I have specific names I'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, <laughs> I was hoping that was the case. But uh, I would say in terms of experts, uh, some of the biggest ones that I would... So standards and definitions are something that in the tech space, uh, especially when we're talking about harmonizing across international borders, uh, just doesn't exist yet for the AI. And so folks like uh, NIST and ISO, anybody who's kind of working on and has experience in trying to establish these technical standards, I think is critical it's, uh, speaking of after lunch, it's really boring, but it's critical to, to happen. Um, and so I'd invite that group. The other big one, I, I think, especially in this iteration of uh, technology and large language models, is the IP and copyright people. Uh, because OpenAI is getting sued every other week on these things. Um, and Google also has some pending lawsuits on that. And I just don't think they've figured out what the technology's use of the data that it needs to consume means in the apparatus that we have is in terms of IP and copyright. And I actually think that's going to be long-term really difficult for scaling up the, the, the use and, and, and deployment of this technology. Great. And, and I love how in this uh, format, I'm actually outsourcing my job to, to the panel. So thank you for asking great questions. Um, so let's move on to our next speaker. And we'll have an opportunity to dive deeper into all these topics um, uh, after your presentations. I wanted to bring up Laura Adams, uh, Senior Advisor at the National Academy of Medicine. And Laura, as you come up, uh, here's what I think the audience is thinking. So we just heard from Tom about the messiness in the policy landscape. If you take it one step down, there's also messiness when it comes to guidance documents, codes of conduct, um, uh, best practices um, uh, that are coming from both within government and outside of government. Just to give you a few examples, we heard about the NISC AI risk management framework. We have a, a trustworthy, um, sorry, blueprint for trustworthy AI from CHAI, a coalition for health AI. We also have some uh, guidance documents from the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, one, what do these guidance documents tell us? And uh, using a clinical example, you know, we worry about alarm fatigue in the hospital, particularly in a place like an ICU, where you just got beeping constantly going on, you just drone it out. Are we at risk for AI guidance fatigue? Um, you know, are we at risk of just hearing so much of what we should be doing um, that we just stop caring about it? Um, and so help me make the case for why the NAM AI code of conduct is going to cut through the noise and how it differs from these other efforts. Sure. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to be able to have a, an opportunity to interact with all of you. I want to take that first question of 
Um, what does it say that we're developing all of these? <clears throat> I think the good news on this front is everybody recognizes that there's enormous promise and there's also significant peril. So I wouldn't want to be rushing headlong into this thinking there's only an upside to it. I also wouldn't want to be focusing only on the downside. So I think the good news is that people are trying to make sure that AI does not break bad because we know that this would be a crushing blow to something so with so much promise for the future. On the other hand, I think because of these concerns, we keep seeing, and in fact, it was the genesis for the Code of Conduct project in the beginning as we were approached by people that said, gee, for crying out loud, every day we turn around, there's a new guideline principle framework that's put out. And so the good news is that everybody's putting out guidelines, principles, and frameworks. And the bad news is the same because we have now fragmentation, and in healthcare, we have seem to have this penchant for fragmentation, where we will go down our own silos. And as Julia said, Julia said earlier today, that idea of feeling we want to work in our own silo and get it right there without thinking of the impact on others in the system. And so the Code of Conduct project is, if we can think about harmonization of data standards, harmonization interoperability, why can't we think a little bit about governance interoperability? For me, it was so important when I was beginning to do the living laboratory in Rhode Island to see if we could link up all of the data sources there clinically and put it into a central repository. It was really exciting for me to be able to do that, but we knew we needed an ironclad privacy framework. So we worked with um, opponents like the ACLU and the Coalition Against Domestic Violence who came in and said, you have a breach in this system. It's like slitting a feather pillow in the wind. You'll never get that information back. So they were so interested in building an ironclad uh, privacy framework. So we did. And then I couldn't wait to share our data with the rest of the states and the nation. I turn around. We made out pretty well in the uh, AI, in the um, rather the High Tech Act. We got 27 million in 90 days in just our first three grants, and we were off to the races building our health information exchange. And so, but we spent way too much of that funding that we got on attorneys trying to reconcile privacy frameworks before we could either exchange any shred of data. So, can we think a little bit about what is that? So, the code of the con code of conduct project was to take a look at. What are the commonalities here? What are we sort of in violent agreement on? Where are the gaps? What are the things we need to be paying attention to? But that's only the first element of the code of conduct. The other three elements that are, I think, critically important, maybe more than the harmonized principle sets, were can we distill this now into something memorable? Five or six commitments. Almost think of it like the Ten Commandments, but not ten, just about six. We base that on complex adaptive systems theory. Well, we, began, we saw in that theory that very, very complex behaviors in the world are governed by very simple rules. We see that all the time. I saw it in quality improvement in my background, whether it was central line infections, we want to de decrease uh, perioperative uh, infection rates, whatever it was, it almost always boiled down to do about five things, do them consistently for every single patient, and you'll drop the bottom out of those complications. And so we started thinking, what are those six simple rules? So you'll see them come out on the 29th of this month in the Code of Conduct Commentary Publication for Public Comment. You'll see the harmonized principles. By the way, there's a heavy overlay with the learning health system. I think with AI, if we didn't think we needed the learning health system before, we know we need one now because this is an all-teach, all-learn moment. I was thinking about Judy's remarks and how she and I spoke at lunch, and she mentioned um, being a humble learner. And I think that ought to be our goal and aspiration for our own conduct and behaviors is being humble learners. We have a lot to learn, and we will for the foreseeable future. There won't be a time when I think we tackle this and we're done. So when I think about what it means, I want you to know who's behind the Code of Conduct. The CEO of Mayo, so um, we have Gianrico Ferrugia, is one of the co-chairs. Uh, Bakul Patel, who is the Digital Health Strategy Global Lead for Google. And Roy Jakob, who is the CEO of Royal Dutch Phillips in the Netherlands. And you'll see here on our AI Code of Conduct, if I can get this slide to change, um, I like to do this without names first to see how many faces you can recognize. I know these are going to say, hey, there's Andy Weinman, Chief Medical Officer from Kaiser. Yes, there's Andy Weinman, and he even goes as far as not just to serve on our steering committee, but he's serving on one of our work groups that I'm going to explain a little bit about in a moment. But um, I'll give you a minute to take a look. That's um, P. 
Peter Lee from Microsoft on there too, Eric Horvitz also from Microsoft on there, uh, Suchi Saria, brilliant mind in AI, just absolutely amazing. Grace Cordovano, one of the most articulate, outspoken, and effective patient advocates you'll ever come across. Um, I was astonished in watching Grace at our first couple of steering committee meetings because we might be talking along the lines of things and we got insular and more insular and more insular. And she would make one or two statements and everyone's head would snap around to what it meant to be. We were talking about something that was, might be important, important to patients and families. And she cut through all of that by saying, listen, patients and families, family members, they want their family member to live. Patients, they want to live. They want to be able to raise their children. They want to be able to live out their lives. And in doing so, here's what they need, crystal clear. So I love this steering committee. I'll give you the names on it. You'll advance. There we go. So you can take a look at the, the names on the steering committee. We wanted Sanjay Gupta because we wanted to be able to get good communications advice on this. And what we're finding here is that we have strong equity and ethics experts that have guided our work every step of the way. We, too, are worried about workforce. Peter Mate and his work at IHI, uh, quality improvement. I'm looking across the landscape of those organizations that I'm interacting with now that are putting together their work on AI, and I think, hey, those of you that made investments in quality improvement, in Plan, Do, Study, Act, in that idea of small-scale tests of rapid change, you're way ahead. You made a smart investment because, as we heard today, so much of the success of AI has to do with can you implement it in your own setting. So the Code of Conduct Initiative goals are that governance interoperability. We want to be able to, can we have a common language to start with so that we're not trying to reconcile all of these? And by the way, we do recognize that in working with these coalitions that we're working with, the NIST Risk Management Framework, for instance, is a, an exquisitely well-done document. It's 42 pages, though, and if you are a sort of community health system CEO and you're trying to look at that document for guidance, I might recommend, well, maybe I wouldn't go this far, but you might want a cardiac defibrillator nearby because you are going to have palpitations when you think, oh, my God, there is no way I can put 42 pages of detailed requirements. I can't build that into my system. They're going to stop breathing. So we think that some of these publications are suited for some audiences, some are not suited for that. So we're working with a number of coalitions. The Coalition for Health AI, many of you know that that coincided today with their announcement of their board of directors. They're formally incorporated now. We're super excited. They're going to be putting together a network of certification labs for AI. We're excited at the National Academy of Medicine because they will certify to our code of conduct. So this is what it looks like when we begin to align. The most wonderful thing about us running a little bit scared about AI, at least having the wherewithal to know what we don't know, or at least have an inkling about what we don't know, is that we're coming together in big time, big ways to learn. We're doing more and more. I think about Steve Jobs' admonition to us about when we've got really difficult problems or we've got complex things to work through, the most exciting thing to think about here is collect as many dots as you can. The more dots you connect, the more dots that we can pull together and get general pictures and come up with creativity. So these are the groups, the Light Collective is that group of organizations that are rare disease advocates. They are the patient voices, and they are helping us put together the translation of what this looks like when you take the code of conduct down to another level. We can't stop at the code of conduct. We've got to translate it into what does it look like from those perspectives so that we're creating an interstitium, a connective tissue, and we don't just proceed ahead without regard for each other. So that's what we mean when we're talking about the um, roles and accountabilities component of that. And boy, are the consumers giving us an earful. They're telling us exactly what those behaviors look like if you really are including them as patients. They're even developing a scorecard to say you can score yourselves, and by the way, we want to score you as well. And the last thing that I'll say is that it translates it into behaviors. And then, once again, the other thing that we're looking at here is when I think of, of, of bias and my concern about a digital divide, another equity divide, I'm concerned not only that the algorithms are biased, but I'm concerned that those with the most resources are now galloping ahead. 
Most Americans get their care in mid-sized hospitals, in community health centers, in rural hospitals, critical access hospitals, in these places where they're not as well resourced. We want to, in this Code of Conduct project, describe what it means to build the resources in the center so that all of us can proceed, so that we don't, once again, prevent the patients being served by those entities from getting what it is that they need out of AI, because frankly, they probably need it more. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Laura. Always so eloquent. And while you didn't say it explicitly, I think one of the advantages of the NAM AI Code of Conduct versus these other efforts is having you. Um, and, uh, you know, really, you talk about being a dot connector, and I, I think you're one of the best dot connectors um, out there. So uh, appreciate your um, and the NAM stance of really being a humble learner and kind of building on the, the great work of many other efforts before it. So um, let me transition back to this uh, reactor panel model. Um, so Tom or Maya, feel free to, to ask your co-panelist or share any remarks. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I'm just curious about the, um, maybe I missed it, but the, the patient input side of things. Yeah. How, how are you capturing that? Oh, thank you so much for asking because I ran out of time and I wanted to be able to tell that part. Uh, the Light Collective is a collection of patient advocacy groups. And so they are in the middle right now. And I don't know that I mentioned that Daniel um, was the first funder in of five funders on our code of conduct. He saw the vision for it immediately, and California Healthcare Foundation, uh, Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, NIH, EPIC, all followed. And we were so pleased. You also funded a group called the Light Collective, and that's Andrea Downing, and she's a brilliant spokesperson <coughs> for patient advocacy. Uh, Andrea Downing found out that their um, BRCA3 breast cancer group that was putting together all of this um, uh, deep sharing going on on Facebook that there was a flaw in Facebook that was allowing their very intimate information to be channeled to other sources. You know, we think of uh, Cambridge Analytica and places like that. She was the first one to discover that flaw. Andrea's no dummy. She's really smart in this field. And so what she has done with Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation funding uh, is to put together the guidebook for what it looks like when you are actively engaging us. So it's built upon, um, they did a patient-led research guidebook which was for researchers to say, we're going to tell you all the different ways in which we want to be involved and be partners in research. We're going to tell you what it looks like when that behavior is poorly done. We're going to put it on a continuum until we can show you what it's like when you really do it extraordinarily well. They're doing the same thing for their AI rights and what they want their roles and responsibilities to be in governance of AI, in deployment of AI. And we're taking that guide and bringing it right into the code of conduct. <clears throat> so a section of our final capstone paper will be that application of what consumers have told us. This is how, these are the behaviors. These, this is what it looks like to apply this and to have us feel as if you've done us justice. I would just, I would just add, if Andrea was in the audience, the, probably the first thing she would say is uh, pay patient advocates for their time and attention. So we definitely want their input, but oftentimes we don't think about reimbursing them for their effort. Yeah, speaking of which, that was my question, is how do we then translate this lessons learned on amplifying the voice of patients on a, say, governance level to the very local um, health system level or even our uh, policymakers? How do they do that um, using that same capability? Yeah, I would mar uh, cite Mark Sendak's work out of, the, um, out of Duke University. He's got a collaborative governance model paper. Um, go get it. Look it up. Uh, S-E-N-D-A-K, Sendak, Mark Sendak, and Suresh Ballou also co-authored that paper. They have done one of the best pieces of work I've seen in actually bringing the voices of the local entities around. Because as much as I appreciate, applaud, and Anticipate, and, and anticipate working with the Coalition for Health AI. We can certify a, a, an algorithm or a model at a certain level. <clears throat> we're almost, not almost, we're always going to need to take that same algorithm. All algorithms are local. All AI is local. And have it fit and tuned to the local environment. And that includes the local voices. We're working now with um, indigenous nations, and they have put together 
um, such ironclad principles about how they want their data used and done, how they want their artifacts regarded, adopted by the Smithsonian Institution. And so I want to see us begin to permeate all of the, the, when we write an implementation manual, when we write an implementation guide, I wanted to talk about not just what you and your own silo should be doing, but what you ought to be doing in relationship to the other people. And I want that written all the way through from the highest levels of governance down to the local community health center. But I think if we can help them develop those guides, give them templates and models for that, um, nobody knows their patient populations like some of these places like a community health center. They have some of the best opportunities in the world to make this and tune this toward the, the true patient needs. So I'd say that that's what we're looking toward. And we've got a lot of work to do ahead, though. I understand that. All right, well, thank you. Um, so moving on to our last speaker, uh, last but not least, Dr. Maya Hightower, um, CEO and founder of Equality AI. So Maya, the question that I have for you is, um, you know, the theme throughout the day was really around uh, inequities and, and risk of algorithmic bias. We know it's a critical issue. We know it's an issue that uh, policymakers are aware of. But sometimes it can feel like there's this massive chasm between acknowledging the problem and actually doing something about it. So can you illuminate us on what policymakers, what health systems, what everyone should be doing to ensure that the AI tools we're using are fair and equitable? Absolutely. That's what I'm going to talk about today. It's about being pragmatic, really making sure that when you are implementing your AI systems, that you have a strategic alignment. And that strategic alignment includes health equity. So AI and health equity are not two separate silos or different parts of your strategy, but intertwined. And the second is really around governance. No matter where you are in your governance structures, you can actually repurpose your existing governance structure. You don't have to pull in you know, a ton of different experts as long as you use what you've got and then grow. So AI governance is extremely important. And then the third pillar is measurement. Whether you're using an, an external source to measure or internal capabilities, but you have to measure the impact of what you implement to ensure that you actually are achieving the outcome that you seek. So that's what I'll talk about. And <laughs> I'm going to stand over there with my little <laughs> pointer uh, because it's actually easier for me to, to stand over here. But I did want to, to, for each of us to take a moment and pause and think about the last time you saw your doctor, the last time maybe a loved one was in a healthcare system. Maybe you were in an exam room and you had one of those you know, cute, attractive robes on that exposes your derriere. And your doctor was probably sitting in front of a computer, typing away. Maybe now there's an ambient system. But how much did you trust that the AI behind the curtain actually was personalized for you? How much did you trust that your loved one in the emergency room or in the operating room, that the AI behind the curtain actually applied to their specific circumstances, the data, the personalization, their genomics, their labs? And for the vast majority of us, you know, Given the right circumstances, we each are at risk of being an outlier. We are each at risk of not being in the middle of the bell curve that that particular model may have been trained on. And so that's why you know, making sure that we are measuring bias, that we are addressing, is so important because we have a long way to go. AI truly has the potential to be our pathway to personalized precision medicine if we do it right. We are at an inflection point. We've talked so much about the promise of AI already. Again, it really does have the opportunity to improve quality of care, drive down costs, and create these ex amazing experiences. A amazing experiences for our patients, amazing experiences for our providers. We just had the whole panel talk about how we're so close for the EHR actually to be a joy. Never in my career did I think that would be a possibility since I've spent my whole career wearing like a flak jacket when it came to the EHR. But to be so close, yet we have so much to do. When it comes to health equity, you know, Martin Luther King said it best, of all the forms of injustice, in, um, in, inequity, 
Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And in the last 50 years, what have we done? Have we done anything since Dr. King said this statement? No, we continue to have the same inequities we had 50 years ago today. So do we have this opportunity with AI to instead of widening the chasm to actually close it? And I do think we do if we implement our AI systems responsibly with health equity intertwined in our AI strategies. And the reason why we know that there is a risk of widening health disparities is because we have caused harm with AI already. We have widened disparities already with AI systems. Example, Obermeyer et al. You, many of you probably are familiar with the work of Ziad Obermeyer, but he was able to measure the impact of a biased algorithm that was de de deployed in hundreds of healthcare systems, probably at this point has been calculated to have been exposed to 80 million people that decreased resources, case management to referrals to black patients compared to white patients. Black patients, while being equally sick, had 50% less referral rate for case management. The good news is that it was detected and mitigated, that we do have that, paper, that capability of detecting a bias when it, within a model and fixing it. We no longer have to have a model be deployed to 80 million people or 80 million exposures before we recognize that harm has been done. And so bias occurs, and again, this is sort of repetition from earlier today. Um, we had that beautiful um, example in, um, from our, our colleague from Emory. But, but bias occurs across the AI life cycle from those that have the ability to ask a question, so problem formulation. Not all problems have equal voice. If we ask our community members what is most important problem they want solved from AI, it probably isn't to, to improve the revenue cycle, <laughs> rev cycle management or um, auto denials, right? But yet that often is where a huge amount of AI resources are currently targeted is in rev cycle, in cost reduction, in process improvement, which is also very important. But bias occurs from the moment of problem formulation to the real world data that is embedded within our EHR, to how that data is acquired, to the way that the model is developed. There are thousands of decision points in modeling in and of itself. In the Obermeyer example, the, the error that was created was called a labeling error. So they used cost as a proxy for, for risk. And we know systematically that African-American patients spend less healthcare dollars while being equally sick. And so that was the actual error that occurred. So that occurred during the modeling process. The data in itself, the data set, actually had plenty of, of um, higher quality labels that, would have that ultimately produced a better model. To the way that the model was evaluated and to where how it's deployed. We had an example earlier today about you know, a punitive, a negative model versus a positive one, where a very neutral model on, um, on AI, very neutral model on no-show prediction, you can either be punitive as a health system and double book, or you can be assist assistive as a health system and provide resources that actually addresses why somebody might be at high risk for no-show. So bias can occur throughout the AI life cycle. And the great thing is that bias mitigation can occur throughout the AI life cycle. And so when it comes to different mitigation techniques, we have a combination of social methods. So some of them do not require any technology in and of itself. You can start with diverse teams, with AI governance, you know, with um, our regulatory environment, with applying some of these principles that we've talked about by my panel members. All the way to more technical approaches where you can actually dissect the data set, you know, the, the model itself, and measure for precision and performance by subpopulation. You know, for that same instance of, say you go to the doctor and you wanna know if it's personalized to you, you can actually ask the folks at Kaiser for the performance of the model by subpopulation. 
we heard that this morning, which is fantastic. How do, is it accurate if you're African American? Is it accurate if you're Asian American? <clears throat> right? And then the fairness of it. Are the distribution of resources equitable across subpopulations? Are the mammogram referral rates that this mo model may be triggering equitable? Does it match the demographics of the people that the pro that population is serving? So those are some of the very technical and can get way into the weeds on the technical approaches to bias mitigation. But what that leaves is this challenge, right? There's most when you talk to healthcare, when I talk to healthcare leaders, they're feeling this overwhelming sense of competing priorities. Where do I start? And that's really where, again, three simple steps. Your AI strategy, making sure that your organization is prioritizing what's important, including health equity. And with that roles, your AI governance, making sure you have an AI governance system in place, and then holding your AI governance system accountable through measurement. You can measure through an audit. You can measure through technical me methods. There's a lot of ways of measuring, but measurement is so important. So the way that we approach it at, at Equality AI is really helping health systems find that, that alignment um, it, by, by domain and making sure that their AI strategy really does align to what's important for that health for that healthcare system. And then AI governance. There's a lot of different uh, frameworks for AI governance. Personally, NIST and ISO, yes, it may be dizzying. If you think 42 pages for NIST is, is extensive, we've heard about the 200 pages for the ISO standard. <laughs> so, so it, but it, it, these are, there are more simplified versions. You just talked about Mark Sendak's works. So that is the Duke work over on that bottom right-hand corner. And then um, Obermeyer at, at all, Ziad Obermeyer has his own playbook, the algorithmic bias playbook that Booth um, New Chicago has published. And then the, the model, when you audit a model, you actually audit by two different methods, the technical approach, but also process. So did the model go through the AI governance process as it was intended? So we each have a role to play, regardless of, of what hat you wear. If you're a healthcare administrator, your role is to make sure that from the top, that your AI strategy includes health equity, that you're appropriately resourcing your teams to provide AI governance, policy, accountability within your system, and they're actually checking to make sure that those processes are working. If you are a doctor, if you're a clinician, it's being a part of those AI governance committees, making sure your voice is part of the solution. If you're a patient advocate, that you too are part of AI governance and that your, your voice is being represented. If you are a policymaker, making sure that we have some guardrails, that we have some foundation, because right now it is very confusing for healthcare systems. And so I'll just, the call to action really is straightforward. Again, AI strategy, aligning with your health equity goals, governance, and then measure. So, that's it. All right, so let me open it up. Laura, Tom. I loved it. Um, I have, uh, what I think I heard you say is that uh, AI is the problem and AI is the solution <laughs> yes. um, with regard to the, its ability to detect and uh, to help mitigate bias. So the very problem it sort of create. well, it's not creating, it was created before, but it, it, it scales and exacerbates the problem, can also be part of the solution. Can you say, Maya, where more places where you think AI will be the solution to some of these super intractable long-term problems that we've had um, very little success in actually um, you know, addressing? Well, if you were to ask the folks at Microsoft and Google, they'd say uh, the environmental issues. But the same, like the, one of the biggest challenges of AI and big data and high performance compute is the incredible amount of energy. We don't talk about, we haven't talked about the incredible amount of energy it consumes, uh, but the argument is that as well, that there may be some innovative solutions that AI is able to generate that may solve some of our um, climate uh, concerns. Not saying that it's true, <laughs> but... Uh, besides health equity and, and healthcare in and of itself, precision performance medicine. 
So, and also water consumes a lot of water as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, very very cognizant of the the lack of of uh, trust that um, some companies have with policymakers in terms of the volunteer solutions that are out there. How do you make this enforceable? Yeah, I, the only way that you can make it enforceable is through regulation. I do think you, what you talked about, the use case approach within healthcare, there is an incredible opportunity for HHS and the various HHS, HHS agencies to use the executive um, orders that they've been given uh, to actually implement um, regulation that are very targeted. So ONC has done a great job where they now, their proposed rule has become a final rule um, by which EHRs um, are required to have certain checks and balances in place when it comes to AI systems. Um, it will be, the FDA is moving in a similar direction when it comes to software as a medical device. They have guidelines right now and many of, much of pharma are already adopting some of these guidelines when they are using software as a medical device. Um, a lot of healthcare tech companies want to be FDA certified as a marker of good uh, citizenship. Um, so similar to, uh, you know, in environmentalism to be a good environmental partner. And so I think that there is possible an op opportunity at that um, a very targeted HHS um, agency level uh, to m have meaningful regulation sooner rather than later. All right. Well, um, we're going to transition to a, a, a moderated Q&A and then an open Q&A. But actually, um, I, I wanted to, to um, because, Laura, you, you stole one of my questions around the uh, positive uh, uses of AI for addressing inequity um, as opposed to exacerbating it. And for me, my favorite example is actually also from uh, Ziad Obermeyer and Emmett Pearson um, around um, predicting pain from an X-ray image of, uh, of a knee film. And so um, everyone knows Ziad's work around the, um, uh, the, the algorithm around case management that was biased, but he also uh, did another study that I, I loved, which is they simply trained an algorithm to predict a patient's subjective report of pain, um, which they happened to be able to collect and what they found were that uh, human radiologists uh, were very biased in identifying or accurately assessing pain in black patients. It's partly because they were trained on kind of um, severity levels of osteoarthritis based on you know, traditional cohorts of patients in the past. And the AI algorithm were, were not biased by those same uh, training approaches. And so they were just much better at accurately predicting um, subjective pain in black patients than human radiologists were. And so in the same way, I mean, the AI is uh, intrinsically, you know, it's as biased as we want it to be, and so a lot of it is in the problem definition. But, but there are a lot of examples there if you're training towards outcomes as opposed to training towards human uh, interpretation that you can actually get less biased results. Um, but let's, let's transition, up, or people may have thoughts on that comment. <clears throat> All right, okay. Um, so, Tom, I have a question around um, regulatory burden. And, and Laura, you actually mentioned this in your, in your remarks, this, this concern that, um, yes, we need regulation, we need guardrails here, um, but if the burden is a little bit too high, it's one thing for Kaiser Permanente. I mean, we've got a lot of people, we've got just tons of expertise when it comes to compliance, when it comes to legal, um, uh, legal functions, when it comes to the technical expertise. So, you know, we're welcome. Uh, we're, we're happy to kind of, you know, to excel in those environments. But I worry about what Laura was describing. You know, care oftentimes happens in the non, you know, Mayos or Stanfords or Dukes of the world. Um, how do we provide policy solutions that work for them, that, that doesn't actually kind of create the system of AI haves and have nots? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it kind of gets to the heart of the debate currently with this. Um, you know, uh, look, the, the folks that are incumbent dominant players in this space and the folks that represent industries that are already highly regulated, they know how to approach these things. They know how to either create uh, products that meet compliance or, uh, you know, comp that are uh, catered towards the regulatory environment that they're in. 
And the smaller folks and um, the ones that are startups, they don't have either the capital or the expertise on staff. And so that is a debate that happens quite often is, you know, how do you make sure that you are addressing some of these issues around, um, you know, very real negative externalities, while at the same time not favoring the big incumbents and the regulatory folks that are in the space. And I think that's really hard to do. Um, I, I, you know, I, I struggle with that question quite often, uh, but I also struggle with the conversation of, you know, what we would, what would happen if we don't do anything, right? And so if we completely ignore this idea and kind of embrace uh, non-regulation as the fuel for innovation, well, then we get in some negative use cases around, um, you know, in, not going to name names, but insurance companies unit for uh, end of life care, whatever it might be, and that that was a really bad outcome um, that uh, I think drives the, the policy questions around, well, we can't do nothing. Um, one area that I think we can look at is uh, a lot of tech companies, they don't want to be the ones that come out and say, this is what we need to do in this space. Uh, same with you know, healthcare, I imagine, I'm, though I'm not a healthcare guy. Um, and they want to codify what they're already doing because they've built processes and teams around what they're already doing. And if they can standardize that, then that means that they can standardize it for uh, a lot. They can mitimate, minim minimize some of the risks that they have in that space. And I think there's something to be said about that when it comes to the voluntary commitments that a lot of folks have already talked about. The White House came out on what NIST is doing and uh, the huge amount of, uh, of support that's happened there. And so there are kind of these indicators of, you know, uh, different regulatory practices that won't inhibit further development of this. Laura. Um, I would love to see, when we think about when we needed EHRs to get implemented, I mean, Economist magazine had ranked us second only to mining, healthcare, second only to mining for lack of investment in health IT. You know, we liked technology. We can look in every molecule of the human body. We just couldn't get your lab test across the street, even if your life depended on it. So when I think about the approach the federal government used at that time, it was to ask ONC to put together, and they, we put together this in the High Tech Act. Let every single solitary physician provider out there got up to $63,000 per provider to do the transition, to do what it took to get up to speed, to understand, to acquire technology, and do those things. And we also had things put together under that same act called the regional extension centers. You know, um, these are the, like in agriculture where you go out and you help small farmers understand the newest technologies, the newest science to go on with things. I think we need to begin to replicate that and put that back in place for all of the places that do not have the resources. Create regional collaborations, create vaults and banks where we can start to see how algorithms are functioning in critical access hospitals, create communication nexus where they can begin to share. I loved what Julia said about we're working with some other healthcare facility over here. They're going to be testing and trying this one. We're going to test and try this one over here, and then we're going to combine our learning. Let's do that at scale, and let's do it directed toward those that do not have the, um, the resources to do it. I think we can replicate the regional extension centers and really take a run at this. What about you, Maya? Yeah, I love that idea of uh, recreating the, the High Tech Act because I was a primary care doctor in private practice um, when we implemented the EHRs and I got one of those cool checks. Like It was like literally like $30,000 at the end of the year. And I was like, cha-ching. <laughs> I was already over my, my margin for the year. When you're in private practice, you know, every dollar counts. So definitely re recall that. But I do think that there is plenty of opportunity to, again, align, um, say, HHS with whether it's meaningful use ONC and meaningful use type of approach or just plain CMS and CMMI having some sort of um, incentivized projects and uh, innovation projects around appropriate responsible AI implementation. I think there's plenty of opportunity for both uh, some sort of carrot versus stick approach and definitely starting with carrots that has always been very helpful in healthcare was when they start with carrots incentives and then you know by the time 10 15 years goes by uh, the penalties start kicking in uh, but there's plenty of frameworks that hhs and onc and um, you know unit cms can use as examples and frame similar type of policy and incentives. 
my next question actually goes uh, back to you, Maya. Um, the last time that we met, you were still at the University of Chicago yes. um, as the EVP and Chief Digital Transformation Officer there. Um, you've since gone, you know, and, and um, full time into this startup. Um, and you talk about the importance of, of AI governance um, and getting this right. And so it's a bit of a meta question, but can you simulate the conversation between Maya, the physician executive, that has tight margins that are just coming out of COVID and, you know, we're told to cut costs and, um, and then, you know, Maya, the, 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 the startup CEO that's trying to sell into University of Chicago um, of why we need this. What, what does that conversation look like? We could probably, I don't know, simulate that in ChatGPT as well, but. <laughs> I think the, the conversation really is, okay, what's keeping you up at night? And I've spoken to many healthcare IT leaders, and what's keeping them up at night, at night is the loss of um, focus on health equity. The sense that we've lost, that the demand for increased productivity and decreased cost has taken away from the overarching mission. If you ask healthcare IT leaders, those that were in the throes of the pandemic, that had this huge rallying cry with purpose around the pandemic and health equity. Now it feels like we've made this about shift and no longer is equity and uh, quality and all the rest of the mission so important, but we have to drive down costs and increase productivity. We need another tool that's going to help our providers you know, see more patients, or that's not, <laughs> sometimes it's, it's spun as you know, a wellness tool. Uh, but in the back of the head is like how we're going to pay for it, um, which usually means increased productivity. So what I, I say, my conversation to the, uh, the executive me is, wouldn't there, there is a possibility for aligning that your health equity and quality and patient experience mission that has always been part of our mission with AI without the AI being a detractor and just about increasing productivity, decreasing costs, and potentially uh, the, the cost of some of our employees. That there is this bright side if we make these choices around you know, setting up our AI strategy in the very beginning to align with health equity, that we continue to have, that we have AI governance, which AI governance is just a fancy word for clinical decision support governance. You already have clinical decision support governance. Now you just need a few extra experts, <laughs> uh, but it's not that much different. And then um, really making sure that you're measuring. So uh, that's the conversation that I have is. <laughs> you know, that, that you're having in your own head. <laughs> in my own head is how do you get the joy back for the poor IT people? Everyone talk about the joy of medicine for the clinicians. Believe me, our IT teams are so tired they are, they've been, uh, you know, ad adapting to change for the last four years nonstop. Uh, the clinicians were the heroes, but in the back end, the IT teams were basically duplicating, creating whole hospitals, whole health systems uh, digitally. And so, of course, I got to hear that because these are my team members, and yet nobody was, you know, waving the hero flag for our IT team. Uh, but they, too, have been through a lot in the last five years. Right. I saw a meme yesterday. It was clearly a, maybe an 80-year-old gentleman's picture, and it said, you know, um, IT is the fun, exciting place to be, you know, like Mark, 28 you know, years old. And clearly this was a picture of an 80-year-old man, and they were assuming this was a 25-year-old person making this statement. So there was a, the picture about that. I think you're bringing up something really critical that we would be remiss to close out a conference like this without talking about how are we incented. Because I have heard people say we can't wait to use nuance, a bridge, whatever, ambi the ambient, picking it up, uh, and being able to reduce the provider time. And the providers are whispering, yeah, so they'll add more people to our panel. Um, that we're not going to save more time, spend more time with our patients. This is not happening. Um, the thing that, um, why I will drop everything and speak at a Kaiser conference above all is because you have the payment model figured out for your patients. Um, I wish I'd lived near where my family could be cared for by Kaiser because I worry so much about our incentive model. The reason I worry about it is because 
um, it isn't aligned with the patient's best interest like Kaiser's is. You're self-contained. You're, you're integrated. You've got it all. Payer all the way through to delivery. When I think about, I was in Rhode Island, and at our health information exchange, we were able to build capabilities onto that system where we could identify and notify a provider in real time in the primary care setting that your patient has gone in or out of any hospital in any state uh, any part of the state in Rhode Island or in and out of any ED. They could give us their high-risk panels and say, track these people so our care managers know in a nanosecond. We watched people be able to be healthier, be kept out of the hospital, get things prevented. And one of my CEOs in, a, in that state shut it off. And so when I went to see him, I sat down and I said, hey, um, John, <laughs> you shut off the system. Why did you shut it off? And he said, um, I had to, Laura, because it works. He said, the system keeps these patients out of the hospital. And he said, frankly, I run the whole health system, and I can't keep my hospital open unless those people are sick and admitted. He said, so I've got to have them sick so I can have that revenue from the admission so I can keep the other services going. He didn't say that with a blank look on his face or with a half smile on his face. He said it with anguish on his face. And my sense is that we do have a health incentive system here that doesn't set us up to do the best, outside of Kaiser, because you, again, have your incentives aligned. The rest of the world doesn't, and I don't think AI is any solution for that. I think we've got to take that on head on. Maybe AI can help us with that, but it's no magic bullet for it. Um, we've got to summon the will to move toward value-based payments models a whole lot faster than we already are. I, I can I can look at it, you know, Tony, and like we're definitely inviting Laura to the next panel discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll drop everything and show up because uh, I want everybody uh, to be aligned like you are. Thank you. Well, well, let me open it up to the audience Q and A. I think it's come up a few times today, like can we get access to broader, better data sets um, and that can be sort of available to anyone that wants to build a model and, and train a model on it. It's, I know it's just one of the steps along the way, but it feels like a really important one. And so could you just comment on the pathway to that endpoint? Like what would it take for Kaiser to share all their data with anyone that wants to develop a model on it? Um, and is regulation the only way to get there or do you see any sort of private sector models that might get us there? I mean, maybe I guess I'll start in, in my KP role. Um, you know, what really attracted me to KP, and I think many people here as well, is, I mean, we do really have quite remarkable um, data sets. Vivian spoke about them. And one of the things that I learned about KP is that um, not only do we have deep and broad data, we have longitudinal data. You know, the average Kaiser member stays with us for 11 years. And so when you're really trying to look at outcomes, we've got that outcome data. Um, so one is, as uh, Laura mentioned, there's, a, there's a, another event, the Coalition for Health AI, and this whole concept of quality assurance labs, and um, you know, how do we build the wire cutter or the consumer reports for AI in an independent kind of third-party validator service. Um, when I look at the organizations that are lining up to, to fill that role, I see the usual suspects, you know, Mayo, Stanford, probably UCSF is on that short list. Um, I think KP is a great place to play. Um, um, you know, I need to make the case internally that we could, but uh, when I think about a lot of the issues around diversity of data sets, we, we've got that. You know, our 12.5 million members across eight states um, uh, and the depth of the data we have uh, looks a lot more like the rest of America than Palo Alto does. Uh, you know, and Stanford delivers great care, but it just it doesn't look like the care we deliver in Oakland or the populations that we care for there. So, um, you know, I, I, but Kaiser is just one healthcare system. I think there are others, um, um, you know, that similarly reflect that diversity. I would love to see county health systems and rural hospitals contributing data. Um, and so if I put my Moore Foundation hat on, we were funding in that space. Um, and so just to give you one example, we gave a grant to uh, Contra Costa County, uh, their health system, to, uh, uh, make their EKG data available for public use. And it took one year for the data use agreement to get signed. Um, so of our grant dollars, not a single dollar was spent because they've never signed a data use sharing agreement. They didn't even know the lawyer that had the authority to sign it. 
And so I do think that there are huge, almost infrastructural gaps around making data available. It's easy to talk about it from the stage that health systems should be contributing their data. I think the challenge really is that, you know, the academic medical centers, there is very much an intrinsic motivation for making their data AI ready, for doing research on it. We don't have that necessarily in the other care delivery systems. And so I'd love to see us move forward, but, but I, I do think that there are big structural issues that stand in the way. I think that um, it's going to become infinitely easier to get a hold of data sets soon, but only if you have money. Um, Peter Lee, at a recent uh, conference that we had with Harvard, was on a panel with me, and he said, here's what I see for the future. Hospitals haven't had a very good opportunity to monetize the, the data that they have, and that was pre-AI. Um, all bets are off now that this is going to become suddenly super valuable data for those. It'll become, from the hospital's point of view, oh, my God, do I have a revenue stream here? And I think that I, I think back to Michael Millinson's point that uh, if data is the new oil, then patient rights and privacy is climate change. And I, I think we're coming up on an era where we're going to see a shift in that for money. And, and I'm, I'm very, very worried about the imbalance and how that will play out. Uh, because I do think that's going to be a suddenly an issue for patient privacy rights where organizations are will, going to be willing to give up because they, they're, they're dying for the resources that they need. And um, we've got a lot of conversation to be had in that arena before that future comes. And it's soon. Absolutely. And I think we need to remember that each data point in healthcare is a digital representation of a person's experience. Yeah. Right? So who really owns the data? And health systems were just fiduciary, you know, managers of patient, individual patient data. And so until we figure out how to actually adequately protect um, a patient's privacy or their patient's wishes when it comes to their data, I think we're going to have, you know, whether you call them structural barriers, but um, I also think that there are protections, right, for who really is... Uh, the owner of that data when it's your digital twin. Yeah, um, I'm not a healthcare guy, so I might butcher this, but, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that in terms of digital twinning and, you know, the, the case of Henrietta Lacks um, mm -hmm. and, you yep. know, the fact that the family took generations to get a retribution for that. What does that mean in the space of a digital health world where, um, you know, you know, it might not be one person. It might be multiple thousands of people that uh, ultimately have their data used for some out long term outcome. Yeah, I think the flip side, though, um, you know, one of my colleagues at KP, Vinny Liu, left to say not an ounce of data wasted. Um, and so, you know, our patients entrust us with this healthcare data, um, but they also entrust that we're learning from it. And they're, we're using it for good purpose as well. And so um, I think most of our patients uh, again, if we were to survey them, would say, please, like we want to advance care delivery. We want to advance mm -hmm. the state of the art. We want better care for ourselves. I want more personalized care. Use my data to make my care more personalized. So I, I think there's always a double-edged sword. We certainly care about privacy. We certainly care about data rights. Um, I also think that, that um, you know, our patients are expecting us in some ways to really make sure that we're um, um, leveraging this precious resource for greatest impact. Absolutely, and that would come through consent, consent as well as, well as transparency, yeah. right? So if you have the systems in place, then you can definitely ensure that you're appropriately using the uh, data that has been consented to, for that use, and discovery agree. is part of that. Yeah, totally agree. It's like donating blood, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's just doing good for the system and doing good for the whole. All right. Well, with that, um, we're going to close. Oh. Oh, okay. I was just going to make one comment on yes. this, and um, I really appreciate all of the comments around this last question, and, and Julie, your question about this, which is a really, really important policy question. We've, we've had a number, we've had a large number of sessions in this space that the Institute has put on around drug pricing, and at the central, and, and there's a whole bunch of really identifiable reasons why we have problems with drug pricing. And a, a root of a lot of that is the failure to think through the economic model of technology transfer and what's happened through universities to private ownership of the goods that come out of that to how it's then on the market. I would suggest, Daniel, and maybe you and I can both have this conversation with our colleagues, um, there's policy to do in this space. How do we take this, this good, which is this data, 
and how can we make sure that it is used exactly the right way and doesn't create a kind, a, you know, a private ring fence that then winds up being things where people start not doing things because they haven't solved the intellectual property problem. Um, so, you know, how long it takes contracts to be signed. I mean, th these are all the same problem, and it's something that all of us, I think, can work on together and think, if we think of it as a policy problem before somebody puts a solution forward that creates a reality we'll be living with for another 50 years. So I think, excellent question, lots to do in this space. Thank you. Christine. All right, well, um, great comment. Seems like maybe a, a potential uh, topic for the next uh, IHP meeting. Um, but I want to thank my panelists here for your great remarks and insights. Thank you. All right, All right. so it's me again. Um, I've been asked to give some uh, closing remarks uh, for today. Thank you. Um, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank all of our, our panelists, our moderators, um, our organizers for hosting such a wonderful um, and insightful event. You know, I, I've got AI in my title. I'm literally paid to think about this all day long, every day, and yet I've learned so much, um, really, from, uh, from all the people here. And it reminds me of what Julia said earlier on. You know, sometimes we need to kind of uh, stand outside of our own silo uh, because we have so much more to learn from each other. Um, so I've been working in clinical AI for the last decade, um, but I've witnessed, and I think all of us have witnessed, an incredible transformation in just the last 12 to 18 months. For many years, AI has been focused on very narrow but important clinical use cases. For example, trying to identify diabetic retinopathy from an image. But when you talk to patients and providers, these were often viewed as just incremental improvements in care. Um, not transformative. And this was evident when you talked to our providers. When you talked to providers about clinical AI, the general reaction that I got was one of skepticism. And many providers even felt threatened by AI. They felt that it was threatening their sense of professional competency, their sense of autonomy. But something really changed with the, with the advent of generative AI. Suddenly, we have general purpose AI tools that are showing impressive performance across a very wide range of use cases. Moreover, these tools are starting to solve some of the quality of life pain points that, have always, uh, that clinicians have always struggled with, things like administrative burden. And what surprised me most is the physician change in attitude toward these tools, from one of skepticism to one of delight, and now what I'm facing is one of incredible demand. Now, the promise of these AI tools to me is paradoxically, they make medicine more human again. These ambient scribes that we talked about allows providers to turn their attention away from the computer screen and back to patient faces. It gives providers more time at the bedside or in the exam room. And so hearing these benefits, you might think that the natural approach is to move forward as fast as we possibly can. But I think that to move faster and to move further, we have to proceed with caution and vigilance, especially now. Why? Because I believe in these tools, and I also believe that nothing slows innovation more than patient harm, or algorithms that deliver, that promise more than they deliver, or biased algorithms that mimic our history of inequities or biases. Now at KP, I have an incredible privilege and responsibility to help lead our organization's program on responsible AI. For us at KP, responsible AI is a journey. It's not a destination. And just like everything at KP, we strive for excellence, not just compliance. And so what does excellence in responsible AI look like for us? First, it starts with culture, and it starts with system guardrails. So I come from the world of patient safety and healthcare quality. And if there's one thing that I've learned from that environment, it's that to err is human. And so we have to apply that same approach to our AI algorithms. Our algorithms, like humans, are intrinsically fallible. There is only one way to prevent harm and to prevent bias in health AI, and that is to never deploy it at all. But there's a risk in that approach. 
If we all believe in the transformative positive benefits of AI, we have to acknowledge that there's risk in deploying AI, but there's also risk in not deploying AI, the opportunity cost. The only way that we can manage this tension is if we move forward with a culture of responsibility that travels from frontline providers all the way to the most senior executives. We also approach responsible AI as an organizational muscle. We understand that our providers are extremely busy, and so they look to us to do rigorous QA testing on these algorithms, to identify risks and mitigation strategies, to provide actionable education on how they should be using these tools and to create system guardrails that prevents harm from happening in the first place. But we also realize that our upfront risk assessment and mitigation strategies just provides preliminary guidance. We also have to learn by doing. And in order to do that, we need the discipline and the infrastructure to monitor the performance of algorithms we've already deployed, looking for drifts in performance, the introduction of new biases we hadn't thought about. We need the discipline to quantify the real-world impact of our AI algorithms, what I describe as these algorithms return on health, and with the infrastructure to flag and remediate patient harm before they occur, and to learn from these system errors, what Laura talked about as a learning health system. So as I said before, the work for responsible AI is never done. It's a journey, not a destination. And so in closing, I invite you all to join us on this journey. If I've heard one thing today, it's that the stakes are too high for each of us to be doing this on our own. I really hope that industry, policymakers, health systems like KP and others can partner and share their expertise and their perspectives as we think about national frameworks for advancing responsible AI. We've got so much to gain from learning together. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing those reflections. Um, I think you're leaving us all inspired, which is fantastic. So for, t for me, today's conversation, I think, is really a reminder that there is so much work still to be done. But it also makes me really glad that there are so many thoughtful leaders bringing their insights and perspectives to the table. And so we look forward to continuing that conversation and on that note, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers and moderators today. Such a fascinating, uh, so many fascinating conversations. Thank you also to our IHP team, Sassy, Renee, Nicole, Nani, Kristen, and Ben. Thank you. And thank you also to our forum advisory group for all their really helpful advice and assistance. And then thanks also to the team who helped us host today's event, including consultants Maryland and Wendy, um, the Center for Total Health, Spark Street Digital, Kean and Ridgewells. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you in the audience. So thank you. Um, before you leave, we hope that you will take just a couple minutes to take the event survey to give us some feedback. It's very helpful for future events. It's on the event page that you access through the QR code. And if you need that again, it's up on the screen. Um, and then we will be posting a full recording of today's event. So we encourage you to share that with others who may be interested but weren't able to attend today. And this concludes our forum today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>